Hey guys, this is Seth from the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Uh, Bill and I have wrapped up season three, 1944, and we have gotten a lot of requests to combine the episodes in the Battle of Surigao Strait and the Battle of Samar into one. We did two episodes apiece for those uh, two pivotal and you know very, very famous naval battles. So we have been asked to combine those by a lot of you guys, which is fine, that's cool, into one episode each, one for Samar, one for Surigao. So that's what we're going to do for the next two weeks as Bill and I prepare for season four as we get into 1945. There's a lot of stuff we want to do. There's a lot of stuff we want to talk about, a lot of things we want to get to. Um, and frankly, we're preparing. It takes a long time to do that kind of stuff. So we're not cheapening out on you by throwing these two weeks in here. But uh, we thought you know, we would respond to the requests and do that very thing. So this week, we're going to do Surigao Strait. And next week, we're going to do Samar. My name is Seth Parrott, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. And with me is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this fine March 5th morning, Bill? I'm doing great, Seth. And before we begin, I want to make I want to, an announcement, public service announcement. For you Annapolis graduates, Seth and I will be doing a session the afternoon of April 25th at the Naval Academy Alumni Association in Annapolis, the new headquarters. We will share registration details later, but the event will be open to midshipmen and graduates. So if you're in the Annapolis area on April 25th and want to attend, you might want to pencil that date onto your calendar. So Seth, it's, I'm excited about that, but I'm more excited about what we're going to talk about today. I am I am excited about both things, and I just want to say once again, I said it before, I'll say it again, I am honored to have been or to be a part of this uh, event at the Naval Academy, and I will do my best to grace the hallowed halls with my lowly presence. So we'll, we'll do what we can. So <clears throat> those who are watching right now notice a odd formation within the pattern. Uh, instead of our usual three guests, we have four for the first time ever, and the fourth one is a very special guest. Someone we've wanted to have on here for a while, but we'll go in order of uh, seniority, as we say, and we want to welcome our good buddy, John Parshall. John, how are you this fine March day? I am very well, thank you. Lovely to be back here again. Always good to have you, and to welcome uh, Tim to our show for the very first time, we want to welcome Tony Tully. Tony is John's co-author on Shattered Sword. He is the author of the book on the Battle of Surigao Strait. Tony, we are very glad to have you here, man. Thank you very much for joining us. Really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I am too. I'm delighted for the invitation, Seth. I mean, it's looking forward to it. It's going to be a good time. I get, I get to time. say now, my esteemed co-author, don't I? <laughs> yes, you do. You yes. That's right. Yes, you All do. Right. Done that. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Well, before we get started, we want to ask everybody to like and subscribe to our channel. If you haven't already done so, please do so. And if you have done so, thank you very much. So, on with today's show. Revenge. It is a dish best served cold, as the saying goes. And by October 1944, the U.S. Navy had more than served that dish to the Imperial Japanese Navy. Many helpings of the dish, to be perfectly honest. But as your grandma probably told you at family dinners, one more helping ain't gonna hurt you. The same could be said of the U.S. Navy and their attitude towards the Japanese. Full payback for Pearl Harbor would never be exacted until every Japanese ship lay in the ocean's bottom. In reality, by October 1944, that payback had been exacted many times over by America's aircraft carriers, submarines, and naval aviators. In the waters off the Solomons, payback was dished out in the form of American destroyers and cruisers pounding Imperial destroyers and cruisers into submission. Off Guadalcanal, the same could be said when American cruisers and destroyers fought toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mighty, with the then mighty IJN. However, the only time that a surface warship larger than a cruiser engaged in an enemy warship, an American warship larger than a cruiser, was when Washington executed Kirishima that night in November 1942. And for the most part, the ships that had done most of the fighting in 42 were not at Pearl Harbor. Some had not even been built when Pearl was attacked. And of those that were Pearl veterans, only a handful had been damaged during the Japanese raid. The same could not be said for the Pacific Fleet's dreadnoughts of 1941 vintage. The majority of those ships had been ravaged by the Japanese as they were tied up at Battleship Row. 
Their role thus far in the war had been mostly shore bombardment, which was something they excelled at, but not what they were designed for. Many of the sailors aboard battleships, West Virginia, California, Maryland, Tennessee, and Pennsylvania were new sailors, but even the new sailors who had signed up after Pearl could feel the desire to exact revenge on the Japanese that permeated seemingly every inch of those old, proud girls. As the Battle of Lady Gulf swelled in scope by October 25th, those old, proud girls would finally get their chance. They would finally get the chance to avenge their humiliation of December 7th, 1941, at a place called Surigao Strait. And I cannot think of a better guest to have for this program than Tony. So let's dig into this <clears throat> epic naval clash of dreadnoughts, the last time in history, guys. It all starts with the Southern Force. Now, in last week's episode, John, Bill, and I, we talked about Center Force in some respects, talking about Sibuyan Sea and Karita. And we mentioned in passing that there were four forces that were part of Lady Gulf. Center Force, Southern Force, Shima's Force, and of course, Ozawa's Northern Force. Um, the Japanese Southern Force, as it's called, it was another of these Japanese fingers that were designed, uh, assigned to poke the Americans in the eye, so to speak, at Lady Gulf. Along with Kurita's Center Force, Southern Force, under the command of Vice Admiral Nishimura Shoji, and we're going to let you guys dig into Nishimura here in just a minute, was to penetrate Lady Gulf and engage and destroy American amphibious forces supporting the Lady Landings. Now, guys... Southern Force, when you look at the TO and E of everything, Southern Force was significantly weaker than the other forces that are going to be engaged in this battle, aren't, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's basically built around two the two oldest battleships uh, in the Japanese inventory, Fuso and Yamashiro. And, um, <clears throat> you know, just to kind of get into them a little bit, uh, you know that for me, the, the gateway drug to the Imperial Navy was building model ships of, of you know, their cruisers back when I was a fifth grader. And um, there's something very distinctive about Japanese naval architecture. You know, the ships just don't look like anybody else's. And, and again, as a fifth grader, I was like, man, these things are just so cool. And I think that anyone who's into the Imperial Navy would also say that their battleships are incredibly distinctive looking, too, you know, because they've got those incredibly intricate, complicated um, pagoda superstructures. And the doctrinal reason for that was that the Japanese wanted to get their gun uh, directors as high above the waterline as possible because they had a bit of what I would call an outranging fetish. You know, mm -hmm. I've got to hit the enemy as far away as possible. Well, that translated into these crazy looking uh, pagoda superstructures, which I submit actually amounts to a bit of a fetish for anybody who's into the IJN. You know, we're just all into the, oh man, you know, they had the coolest superstructures. And Fuso and, and Yamashiro are just, you know, poster childs for the whole thing. And I, I do, of course, have my my the, the primary nerd book on this battleship. And you could just see, you know, it's just endlessly tall. It's got this 44 cool meters. Yeah, you know, it's got this cool thing that sticks out the back, and it's just, and Yamashiro's got these big supports that hold them up in the back. I mean, they're just like, ooh, super yeah. structures. So these are old ships, though, and, and that's the thing to keep in mind. These are the first uh, post-Dreadnought battleships that the Japanese had launched. They were put in the water uh, in the early part of World War One. They are uh, armed with 14-inch guns. They got six-inch secondaries. One of the problems with them, though, is that they've got 12 14-inch guns, which is quite a bit of armament, but oh, they're yeah, all in yeah. twin turrets, which means that the waterline length of these things and hence the length of the armored box that has to protect those six turrets and their magazines is really long, too, which means that, on average, the armor is not as thick on these things as it could be. Likewise, since these are World War I-era combatants, uh, their anti-torpedo systems are nothing to write home about. They don't have the kind of width and depth to their torpedo bulkhead systems uh, that are going to allow them to resist torpedo damage as well as a ship like, say, Musashi or Yamato or something like that. Tony, anything anything you want to riff on there? Yeah, I would uh, point out, uh, uh, for some audience, a way to really relate to it. It'd be like if the U.S. Navy had sent the Texas and the New York into a surface battle or even the Wyoming, you know, uh, and Arkansas. I mean, uh, they were the oldest ones of the Japanese fleet, even more, the Issei and Huga had just been made into half, half 
hybrid carriers, and they even they were a little bit more modernized than you saw in your Mashra I mean, now. So uh, that that's a way to think about how old they were. I mean, Texas just got renovated, and she dates back to all, she's almost the exact direct contemporary. So that's what's really interesting about it. They're both classic dreadnought battleships. They were uh, they were the biggest ships at the time, uh, but some of the most powerful when they were laid down. But as you know, military, you know, arms race things, they don't last mm -hmm. long. And with, uh, for a while, Flusa was the biggest, best, baddest thing that, that was an operation, but it was only briefly. But yeah. like John said, it, it has a outsized reputation for its particularly convolute pagoda that I had mentioned offhand is 44 meters high. Um, Yamashiro's <laughs> is very much the same thing, but a little more straighter and stiffer. Yeah. Um, and uh, something else I wanted to mention about the battleships in particular is that they had been tied down in training in the NC throughout almost all the war. So yeah. if you take what John said and consider the fact that they also spend all their time, okay, imagine, you know, doing work up in Chesapeake Bay, that kind of thing. That's spending a whole war there. But normally, the Fuso and Yamashiro, they were on secondary duties. And uh, Fuso actually saw a little more use than Yamashiro did in the sense that Yamashiro spent a lot of time in Inland Sea. But that also meant she's kind of kept in good shape. One thing they weren't is in bad shape when they sailed. They were in top-notch condition. And uh, the, the Fuso's crew considered her a happy ship. So these were not, these were not demoralized vessels when they sailed. They actually eagerly did. They're just really old. So, yeah, but, yeah, older older than us. go ahead. No, I have a question though. This is the East on the American side. These ships are, you know, not 20 years. I mean, this is 20 years out of the Great White Fleet, right? With a yeah. lot of evolution happened between the Great White Fleet yeah, and early. this generation of battleships, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and you see too that the, even though these are the oldest battleships they have, they have been extensively modernized. They went through two big refits in the 1930s. Um, among other things, they uh, their main batteries were modified so that they could elevate further and therefore fire farther. And those refits were where those the the pagoda foremast got put on as well. So, I mean, yeah, there, there's certainly an understanding within the Imperial Navy that these are not units that are fit to stand in the main line of battle and that's why they've been doing training duties all all war long um but they have been as modernized as it's possible to do to uh, a unit of that vintage and that's that's what i wanted to ask is oh go ahead go ahead tony just want to interject to important to realize that the other limiting factor not just age they couldn't break 24 knots easily they couldn't reach that like barely 23 or so i mean there was a there's an operation when the Japanese that when the Japanese are preparing for a go during the Philippine Sea battle build up. When the battleship sailed out to sea after Taiho, the Nagato could just barely make 24 knots. So she's barely allowed to participate. Luso couldn't even keep up with that. So she's removed from the operation and given mm -hmm. a secondary sign, which we'll probably get into later. But yeah. So their speed was could barely make over 20 knots that as far as easily. They could really reach. They could reach twenty three if they pushed it. I, that's an important limitation. Also, had they been faster, they might have been more willing to lose. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I wanted to get into. Is that they're part of Bat Div two. They're part of Battleship Division two, and Bat Div two within the IJN was at that time not very, not looked upon very favorably. Uh, right. However, there was one specific mission that they were, or that one of them was assigned to. Why go? during uh, the Marianas campaign. Can you guys get into a little bit of that, about, about how the IJN felt about Bat Div 2 and, and their expendability, really, is that they, they felt that they were expendable? Can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Tony, why go? Oh, okay. Uh, during the Battle of the Philippine Sea, uh, the Japanese were committing, much like they would Lake Tech Gulf later, they were, they were committing to a full effort, in some ways a little bit less on certain areas, but is a full out out effort in the sense that the stakes were considered incredibly high to saving Saipan. So in the enthusiasm as Ozawa's carrier fleet sailed toward its battle, back in Japan, Shigenora Kami, the chief of operations and the Japanese Naval General Staff, a real hothead, okay, came up with the idea of let's have training battleship Yamashiro do its part by sailing from the Inland Sea, packed with soldiers, uh, and uh, beat yourself on Saipan, deliver the soldiers, and become a shore battery to repel 
American Landing Forces. Now, does that sound familiar to some of you? It probably does, because that's the same suicide mission your motto is given. At right. It's the same right. It's the Which is country. crazy. <laughs> you know, but there it is. <laughs> yeah, I'll let John expound upon uh, the, the statistical chances of it. Succeeding. Well, just, you know, the lunacy of trying to take a ship like this and actually beach it and turning it into a sea, a, a battery of some sort is right. going to be pounded to pieces by American aircraft in the space of uh, about 14 minutes. You know, it's just, it's, survivability of these platforms is extremely limited by their maneuverability and if you take all the maneuverability away and turn yourself into a stationary target you know the spittle is running down my chin and we know how that's going to end anyway uh to say that the japanese were grasping at straws here is is a bit of an understatement it's interesting all the same though is that this is you yeah. know a, a first version of a nautical bonsai charge if you will right well, Even we, more we talked so, about yeah. the yeah, yeah. We talked about the two battle wagons. Bill, they, they weren't the only pieces of this Japanese force, though, were they? No, they weren't. You know, the Southern force also consisted of the heavy cruiser Megami and four destroyers, not nearly as powerful as Korea's center force. The Southern force would also be theoretically augmented by an additional force under the command of Vice Admiral Shima Kiyohide. Did I do okay with that, guys? Yep, Kiyohide, um, yep. <laughs> the additional force consisted of an additional seven ships. Shima's force centered around the heavy cruiser Nachi and Ashigara, light cruiser Abu Kuma, and four destroyers. Interesting, guys. I spent a lot of time in Japan. I used to be able to pronounce these words a lot better as I get into my dotage. I lose <laughs> the ability to, to pronounce Japanese names. I don't know why. They're going back to the amino acids once they came. But yeah, I hear you. So. <laughs> the overall commander of the Southern Force was Vice Admiral, now I'm going to try it your way, Tony, Nishimura Shoji. Described with the Imperial Japanese Navy as an old sea dog, even though he's younger than I am now, Nishimura <laughs> had sent, seen his fair share of naval combat throughout the war. Okay, guys. Um, so what about this Nishimura guy? Who was he? What was his history? Can you get into his hard luck background in detail? He was a, this right to Tony. Oh, uh, <laughs> he was a graduate of the of the Ada Gemma class of July 1911. And what's interesting is so was Shima. So they're classmates. They're just about six months apart in seniority. That'll matter later. But uh, he's a class. Uh, he's 59 years old by the time of the event. So, uh, and he had had uh, he had had his background right leading up pre-war. He had commanded some cruises and stuff, but uh, his main interest was in torpedo warfare, as in torpedo boat warfare, Desrons, and destroyer squadrons and the like. And so that was his background when we first hear about him in any major sense. But right after Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese are invading the Philippines, Nishimura is one of the one commanding one of the forces covering the landings at Beacon in the Lingayan area and up in Luzon. Uh, that's his first bit of action. Uh, unfortunately, at near the end of that month, uh, his only son, Teji, is killed during a float recon of all places in the Surigao Strait area. But when we next hear of him in a very major sense, is he's at the Battle of Java Sea and commanded Desron IV. Uh, also present alongside him is Desron II under the famous Tanaka Rezo. Uh, those two Supported by Nachi and her girl, they fight the Battle of Java Sea. The, the bottom line is, I mean, this is a guy that's got pretty extensive experience by this point in the war. I mean, he's fought a number of night battles. He's a torpedo expert. But he's also, I, I would say, somewhat cautious by nature. Is that right. is that fair, Tony? I wouldn't say cautious. It, because What you're really seeing is he plans carefully and deliberately. But once he's set on a course of action, is very forthright and decisive. Okay. A planner he, then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there. Ironically, there's some aspects of them that uh, would look uh, probably looks like spurrents. Mm. Deliberativeness. Right, and right, he, right. Interesting. He uses his assets at Surigao Strait, and I guess we'll get into it a little bit later. He uses what assets he does have, actually better than Korea does, like his recon planes and all that. They were going out attacks on the PT boats, stuff like that. They're even in action during the night battle. That's not commonly realized. So, uh, so. He's very good at planning what he has. You know, he's using what he has. He's doing the same thing at Java C, trying to shepherd the 
because you can imagine shepherding a bunch of merchant ship captains, and that's what yeah. he's trying to do. Not a lot of uh, herding cats. Yeah, yeah just right. To briefly touch on his later career, but but he comes under the idea. Some of the sense of uh, caution comes from a sense of he has he has he comes under a unlucky star at times because, like in 1943, his flagship commando is torpedoed in a night battle by aircraft. Or, or bomb, damaged by bomb. There's some dispute about this what damaged come on, but that uh, and so he gets a reputation for kind of having things go wrong, but never really his fault. The Japanese never really see it as fault. It's just he's it's sort of yeah, as you say, kind under of an unlucky star. Kind of unlucky star. Uh yeah. kind of like the destroyer Shiguri. It's an open question. Is she lucky or a Jonah? See? Yes, yeah, right. She's lucky to herself, right. but every ship she travels with. You know, right, gets her unreal. Yeah, it gets waxed. Yeah. yeah. Well, well uh, let's it, go ahead. Jim. Yeah, go ahead, Seth. I, I was going to say let's let's talk about his plan here for Sir Gal Strait. He he yeah. built. He's got a pretty good. Nishimura's got a pretty good plan, really. If 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 obviously if everything goes right, can you lay it lay it on us? What what is his plan here for Sir Gal? What is his mission? What does he want to do, and how he, how is he going to utilize his forces? So a planner by nature, Nishimura. So yeah, this is we love our bloopers real, by the way. A planner by nature, Nishimura did not plan to rush headlong into the Leyte Gulf. He worked up a good plan of attack. Should the Southern force be able to make its way into the Gulf? Nishimura was working from the latest sightings of Allied ships in Leyte Gulf and worked out his plan in such a way that his destroyers would sweep around the Gulf from the east and head in a northerly direction. I got a map. People always want to see the map. So Absolutely. the plan was to head up <clears throat> down here and then engage the Americans up north. And that's kind of the way it's going to play out, Seth. Yeah. Yeah. To his... extent, though, I, I was just going to say to, to Tony, but part of what he's trying to do here, though, is draw American attention away from right. Korea. And but so it's a Zawa's yeah. mission in reverse from the south. Right. It's the main mission of Zawa is from the north. The the Naval mm -hmm. War College had speculated that it turns out post-war stuff with interviewed Japanese survivors and stuff, especially from Fusan Yamashu, has revealed that that is exactly what it was. They all go there fully expecting to be sunk. They're not really expected to get back. It's not strictly a suicide mission any more than Ozawa's is, and they can get back. But the important thing is to pull the forces out of Korea's way. So Korea has an unexpected approach in the late they go from the east. He's right. going to draw forces down from the into the south. It's always going to draw them north. So, like that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Korea is going to land the haymaker. Is is essentially yes. what it is. Yeah, yeah. that that's that's and, the plan anyway. So, in land warfare, it's called a turning movement, right? You try to get the the you know one op deep offense of it, the enemy force, to pivot. So you can clear them from, you know, hit them on the flanks, in essence. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And and un, not unlike any other Japanese plan that we've seen so far throughout the entire war, really, uh, Nishimura's success depended largely on the element of surprise, which is something he did not possess. He did no. not know this initially, but he did not possess this at all. Go ahead, yeah. John, you were going to say something. No, I was just going to say, yeah, surprise was a commodity that was in very short supply with most Japanese naval operations uh, at this point in the war because our air coverage was so good. Of course, we're going to get a counterexample of that is 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 going to be coming shortly. But yeah, um, Nishimura doesn't have it really. Indeed, he, he his his forces sighted by American aircraft. No surprise here, as we have a fairly large umbrella in the area. Uh, his his forces attacked the day before Surigao Strait by uh, aircraft from the USS Enterprise. And uh, Franklin. Eh, say again? And Franklin. And Franklin, correct, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, late in the afternoon of October 24th, to be exact. Uh, the American force that comes in focuses on both of these battleships. No surprise here. Flyers from Enterprise score hits on uh, Yamashiro with rockets. Uh, who was in the lead of the formation and landed a handful of near misses with bombs. Strafing American fighters did little structural damage, and we see this over and over again. We saw this with Masashi at Sibuyan Sea, and we're going to see it again, obviously, Alf Samar, too. Mm -hmm. um, it, it did little structural damage, but it does knock out a lot of these anti-aircraft gunners. It does kill a lot or wound a lot of people at the very least. 
um, to the rear. And we, we can talk about this in depth here in just a few minutes. Actually, when we get to the destroyer attacks, we will. Uh, Fuso was fearing a little worse than her sister was. She takes a bomb hit near her number two turret. Uh, the weapon penetrated the deck and exploded in or near the number one secondary battery, wiping out the crew in that vicinity, which is obviously a very nasty scene. Uh, soon after, Fuso receives another hit. This one was near her quarter deck. Uh, the bomb landed on her fantail near her catapult, penetrated the deck, and exploded in the wardroom. Uh, one of the ship's depth charges, and John, you put this in the notes, what, what the, the hell is a battleship doing with depth charges? What is a battleship doing carrying depth charges? And I honestly don't know the answer. Do you, Tony? What if, back in the 1939, Fuso's catapult had been moved back under a fantail, just like Yamashiro had. And she carried a group of uh, float planes, Jake float planes, and they were equipped for anti summer uh, okay. warfare to carry depth charges. So she okay. had a pack of depth charges in the sterns for storage. Yeah, I got you. That's what okay. went on. Even okay. in the wreck, you find the bitten out like a bite out of the stern you in the wreck you find that it, there's a big chunk out of the stern <laughs> very 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 strange for a battleship to have depth charges but that makes perfect sense the way you yeah, describe it yeah they're okay they're aerial depth charges. yeah all was so, learning so so, so yeah. Fuso looked like she was in pretty dire straits because what happened is the avgas spills on the deck and everything goes poof and there's a big fire lots of smoke um the float planes that are on Fuso's after quarter are fire uh, she shears out of column so as to direct the smoke from the burning aircraft away from the ship so they could be jettisoned, which they were in short order. Uh, Nishimura aboard Yamashiro was assured by Fuso's captain that the old battleship, despite the fire and springing some leaks, could and would continue her mission. So, Tony, you put in there that this is an accurate description of the air attacks, but you, you said you would call the damage medium and not minor. Why is that? I had in mind that in Japanese uh, damage reports, they use phrases like minor damage, medium damage. Mm. And for what Fuso suffered, it's probably closer to their medium category because anything that creates flooding below, okay, like happened with Fuso, that's that's not minor. That doesn't mean it's major, especially when we think of major, but medium is a term they use for anything that's a little bit more than, well, like strafing damage to the superstructure. Uh, Yamashiro's may be considered medium, too, because it floods the starboard blister. The near misses are enough to rip open the starboard torpedo. Yeah, this, this is me chuckling because it's just yet another indication that, you know, you and I have spent way too much time reading damage control report. <laughs> Instead of kissing girls. I mean, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Yeah, yeah. someone's got to do it. Here we are. All right. Well, Bill, uh, the American air attack by Enterprise and Franklin is really a pittance compared to what Curita had suffered through, wouldn't it? So let's get, get into that with us uh, for a little bit. Yeah, it was. The, the, the Enterprise's uh, aircraft disappeared over the horizon. Nishapura turns his attention back to his primary mission. On the American side, Admiral Davidson in Task Group 38.4 decides that no further attacks would be made that day. He receives orders from Halsey to move nearer to 38.2 and launch attacks against Corita's center force. Okay, they're going to head back north again, thus leaving Nishimura's southern force alone for the remainder of the day. Now, Halsey was aware of the southern force, as you said, Seth, and had rightfully deemed them less important than Corita. This important issue came to, well, this important issue to come from October 24th in regard to the upcoming battle was that the southern force had been sighted. Yeah. There would be no surprise Japanese ambush, but there would be a surprised American ambush, Seth. Way in there, let me tell you. So 7th Fleet Commanding Admiral Thomas Kincaid was keenly aware of Nishimura's southern force and had time to prepare his defenses. Uh, Kincaid assumed that Nishimura was going to pass through Surigao Strait on his way into Lady Gulf, and as such, he signaled his battleship commander one Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf. Now, we've talked about Oldendorf a, a, a ton of times when we're talking about shore bombardment because this is what he, he does. <laughs> yeah, it's what he does. He shoots the land. But he yeah. is also a gunfighting Admiral. Bill, you're an Academy graduate. I'll usually turn these over to you. Tell us about the Academy class of 1909 grad Jesse Oldendorf. Uh, he's legendary, of course. He's a few years younger than than his bosses, 
Halsey and Nimitz commissioned an instant two years after he graduated in 1909. Like most Academy men of the era, he spent the vast majority of his early career on surface ships, destroyers, cruisers, but he did serve on battleships. In the early 1930s, he saw his first major service aboard a battleship when he served as XO in USS West Virginia for two years. When the war began, he initially served the Atlantic. Believe it or not, nobody hears any stories about him. Well, most people, you guys know all about this, don't hear stories about him in the Atlantic, but he was there until 1943. So then he transferred to the Pacific as commander of Cruiser Division 4. Once there, he utilized USS Louisville, heavy cruiser CA-28, as his flagship, which is where he would remain for the majority of the time in the Pacific. In February that same year, Oldendorf was put in command of the fire support vessels as part of terrible Turner's amphibious navy. And we've had a lot of talks I'll about that. put that in there for you, John. Terrible Turner. Yeah, haven't we, John? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. John's uh, favorite geez. admiral. Yeah, my yeah. favorite admiral, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Who had no trouble with alcohol at all. So, no. Holy mm -hmm. Oldendorf saw action at the Marshall's Marianas. Kalalu, Leyte, and Luzon, as his ships provided shore bombardment and call fire support for operations ashore. That's what we were doing with these old battle wagons in those days. But on the eve of Surigao, the highly respected Rear Admiral was in command of Task Force 77.2 and was reacting to orders given to him by Admiral Kincaid, Seth. So there's the setup. Yeah. This is, I would this add is truly a, epic. Go ahead. Sure. I would add uh, Oldendorf uh, was also co a commanding officer of the cruiser USS Houston that mm, went right. down in the Battle of Java Sea. And that right. would come into play this night because Megami, he knew about, was in that force. Right. And Megami was an old enemy of his, had, had sunk Houston in uh, Perth at uh, Bantam Bay in Java Sea. So he was not there, obviously. Going back but, to your yeah. idea of paying back scores. This is one that Oldendorf ha had his eye on Megami in that force because Megami, along with Makuma, which had been sunk all the way back in Midway, they'd been the ones that put down a, a Houston and Perth as well as, you know, the Japanese destroyers that night. That was I, a big oh, yeah. By the way, I got I to gotta say this uh, before we get into naming a bunch of ships. I love the days when you could tell what class a ship was by its name. Um you know, yeah. <laughs> cruisers at worst cities, battleships for state, so, yeah, and all was right the, the world. world. Right. <laughs> Sadly, those days are gone. But those days are gone, gone. indeed. That's correct. So at 1443, Kincaid signals Oldendorf to prepare his force for a night battle against Japanese battleships with the message, quote, enemy can arrive late a gulf tonight, make all preparations for night engagement, end quote. In his order, Kincaid provided Oli with his best intel as to the enemy's strength, disposition, course, and speed. Kincaid also directed Orden Oldendorf to utilize the multitude of PT boats. Now, we've talked about PT boats before, but these guys play a very large role, but yeah. it's a different role than history has said in the past, but regardless, we'll get there. Uh, and 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 by a lot of PT boats, I'm talking like damn near 40. I think he deploys 39 PT boats in the upcoming battle. Yeah, way to Again. think of it as 13... Trios. <laughs> Is that yeah. what I try to remember? Yeah. 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 It's 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 a lot of the plywood craft here. Um, so it's interesting. I put this in the notes. It's interesting to note that Kincaid overstated Nishimura's size to Oldendorf, saying that Southern Force consisted of two battleships, four heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, and ten destroyers. This is a tr much larger than the actual force that was there. Um you know, they only had seven ships in the entire Southern Force. He also advised Olden Oldendorf as to the possibility that the Japanese may have four battleships. And, Tony, this is because Isa and Hayuga are not, they had not sighted these guys. They didn't know where the hell they were, right? Uh, and there were confused sightings from Franklin and Enterprise's planes. Or maybe they thought, maybe they're two forces. See, they didn't have a clear idea because the battleships could look kind of similar and there were more than a few that were thinking there are two two battleship forces coming. Also, there were confused sightings of Shima, who was astern by now, that were mistaken. Nachi and Nishigura were taken for battleships by some. So that may be that may have probably influenced his estimate. Yeah, it's it's not as we have seen. It's not uncommon for aviators to grossly 
exaggerate what they see on the ocean's surface. But never mind that, because Jesse Oldendorf figured that even the force estimate that was given to him that was overstated by Kincaid, he felt that he could deal with that force coming to him no matter what. He had a force at his disposal that would absolutely obliterate anything that may come his way, or so he thought, which obviously comes to pass. Indeed, Oldendorf had more firepower than he would ever possibly need. Bill, get into some of these ships that are with his with Oldendorf's force. It's a it's a it's a beast. It's a load. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. He had six battleships, four heavy cruisers, four light cruisers, 28 destroyers, and as you said, Seth, 39 PT boats. As mentioned earlier, five of the six battleships were Pearl Harbor survivors. Revenge is a dish best served cold. The lone non-Pearl survivor was the Mississippi BB-41. Of the four heavy cruisers, one was the HMAS Shropshire and HMAS Arunta. And, and Jan, you know something about the Arunta, don't you? I, actually, I don't know much about Arunta. The thing that I was struck by was that there's sort of a payback element here, too. And the Shropshire was given to the Australians by the Royal Navy to replace the Canberra, which, of course, had been sunk during the Battle of Savo Island off the of Guadalcanal. Uh, Arunta is is another of these fabulous tribal class destroyers that were just, you know, ubiquitous throughout the, the Royal Navy. But yeah, I, I think it's, you know, even the Aussies are going to get some payback here uh, tonight as part of this this larger battle force. Yeah. So regarding these battleships that we talked about, you know, we, we've made a big deal that they're Pearl Harbor battleships and they are old by fast battleship standard when you compare them like South Dakota and New Jersey. You know, they are old by that standard. However, uh, the oldest one in the line would be Pennsylvania. She was commissioned in 1916. Um while they were old and they were close to the vintage of Fuso and Yamashiro, uh, most of them had been heavily, actually all, had been heavily modernized uh, since the beginning of the war. Specifically, West Virginia and Tennessee were the most up-to-date battleships in the line. They boasted mm -hmm. dual-purpose 5-inch 38s, 40-millimeter Bofors, legions of Ehrlichans, and the most modern air surface radar available. These two ships were more modern, if not significantly slower than anything the Japanese could throw their way. John, you wanted to talk about Weavey in Tennessee specifically. Yeah, so, I mean, these ships were, uh, Weavey in particular, very badly damaged at Pearl, and when they dragged her off the bottom and hauled her back to Seattle to rebuild her, she actually um, gets passed over for some of the other older battleships, and, and she's not out of the yards until, I believe, late 43. Um but one of the things that they did is they massively increased the size of her anti-torpedo blisters. And they realized that this is an old ship and she's never going to go through the Panama Canal again. As soon as this war is over, we are going to scrap her so we don't have to be governed by this 108 you know, foot beam anymore. And the result is that she now uh, has a beam of 114 feet. And a lot of that is anti-torpedo blisters. So... In terms of the depth of her anti-torpedo system, um, both both she and Tennessee have, have just got massive systems. And it was pretty widely acknowledged that, you know, they were probably more resistant to torpedo damage than even ships like the Iowa class because they just had these big systems. Um, any case, I, I just I just kind of thought that that was a cool little tidbit. The other really important piece, though, is that both West Virginia and Tennessee have the Mark 8 uh, fire control radar, which is the latest, greatest set um, in the American head. Is that is that the only two, though, Seth, or am I? No. Uh, West Virginia had Mark 8. Um, oh, good, good. Tennessee had Mark 8. Uh, the, all, the ones who did not were Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and um, California. They did not have, or not, not California, but uh, uh, Mississippi Cal and Pennsylvania did not have yeah. the Mark 8. They had the Mark 3 right. surface radar. And I was just—I was going to nerd out a little bit on radar here because it's mm -hmm. important in this engagement, obviously, because um, the Japanese ships have their own radar. Uh, but if you if you look at what's going on with the Mark Eight versus the older Mark Three, the Mark Eight it has a, a PPI indicator, so you know the the, the classic top-down view of the world. Um, it's built on the cavity magnetron, so it's it's, it's got a lot of power. Uh, Mark 8 set can put out about 40 kilowatts 
Uh, and so the range on this thing, you can see a battleship size target on this on this set from about 40,000 yards away, which is well outside the gunnery range of their main batteries. But it gives you a, a long distance and it's very good in terms of determining range. And it's even relatively good in terms of determining deflection as well. Right. So the ships with Mark 8 are going to have a marked advantage here, if you'll pardon the pun. Meanwhile, the ships with Mark 3, III, Mark 3 is not a bad set. I mean, that's what Washington used uh, to dispatch right. Kirishima, but she also had a really good search set that that helped her out. Meanwhile, if you look at the Japanese, the, the Type 22 radar that Fuso and Yamashiro have is basically a knockoff of the Cavity Magnetron. They had captured one of these things and, you know, they were remanufacturing it. The problem is that their manufacturing quality was terrible. And uh, there was an anecdotal account in one of the things that I read that said of the first 60 uh, Type 22 sets that they produced, only six of them actually operated. So their, their QA was not great. Um, and the power on that unit is only about two kilowatts as opposed to 40 kilowatts. And so it doesn't have nearly the range or the target discrimination uh, that the better American sets have. Yeah. And, John, you I'm know, go back to my... ET days, when my electronic technician days when I was enlisted and, and and ask you, magnetron and not a power klystron? I'm just, uh, <laughs> those are the two. Those are the two competing the designs. Back in these days. Yeah, 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 back good. in those days. So anyway, well, swat I, it back to you. I would yeah, add, I was, I would add something. Uh, the, the Japanese did have a clever offset and it worked nearly as good. I forget the range offhand, but they had what were called radar detectors. And they looked like mm -hmm. they looked a little like badminton paddles from yeah. on, on the front of the destroyers. You could really see them better. But on the cruisers are, and the others, they're more hidden by a superstar. But you really see them on the destroyer bridges more clearly. They look a little like badminton paddles. And they what they could do is they could pick up radar emissions, even bearing and stuff. So in a kind mm -hmm. of roundabout way, the Japanese use the American radar against them. Yeah. They yes. use it to detect, and they often did detect it first meaning got a clear bearing or realized that it's an enemy ship sooner right. than a radar U.S. radar ship realized they were not looking at land on a ship. So sometimes it worked out the same way. I mean, as far as it's for it, setting it gives you a clue that you're being looked at, but it doesn't give you the target discrimination necessary right. to fire. And that's right. the option. No, all it gives you is range. <laughs> bearing. And, yeah, it's not. It doesn't give you range. It's not very accurate in bearing. And, but you can detect twice the range that the radar is detecting. Because it only has to go one way. So that's the advantage. You call it electronic surveillance measures in modern talk. The, the, the key yeah. between the Mark 8 and the Mark 3, though, here is, is is twofold. One, you said that the Mark 8 is, you know, it, and it can. It can it can really get out there. It can distinguish, or it could, distinguish between ships and land, whereas the Mark 3 couldn't. And what's important to note is that the flagship of the American battle line is USS Mississippi which has the Mark III. So mm -hmm. and, and this is this kind of, you would have thought, yeah, you would have thought that, you know, uh, Admiral Whaler would have said, you know what, maybe I need to go to the more modern ship, which would have been at this point, West Virginia, as opposed to USS Mississippi, especially when he knows it's, it's a surface battle coming up. And this does play a part, albeit minor, but it does play a part as to when the battleships do open fire, when the fur balls does start to, uh, unravel here and in, in the very near future yeah. so bill tell us about oldendorf's plan this is about as classic of an am of a naval ambush as you can possibly possibly get yes yeah, so somebody's going to call me a liar because i think in our battle of cape Esperance episode i said that was the last time we ever had a crossing of the t mm -hmm. and maybe that's not true yeah, <laughs> you guys so. you guys can correct me because that's essentially what happens here the battleships would form yeah. Yeah, yeah, the battleships would form in a single file line across the mouth of the strait. I'm going to show you the map here. There it is, right? And um, it looks like crossing a T, sitting in a way, such ways to expose all of their guns, um, their broadsides, in essence, using the main battery against the Japanese as they come up the strait. It's the classic maneuver. On his flanks, Oldendorf deployed his cruisers, Steaming on diagonal lines, these ships would be expected to provide rapid, accurate six and eight inch, six and eight inch main battery fire. Now, were any of these what were they called machine gun cruisers, John? 
Yeah, yeah, we We're do close. have some of our six inch models in there, and and yes, they, as we know, they can put out a very heavy volume of fire. Well, the other thing know. I was going to point out, you know, just on that lovely little map, there's just how constricted the waters are here. Um, the narrowest part of the strait is less than 15 nautical miles apart. And you'll recall when we were talking about uh, the Battle of Savo Island and I was, you know, inveighing against the fact that, you know, it's only about 22 nautical miles from Henderson Field all the way across to Tulagi. These are even tighter waters. And Oldendorf at this point has just built himself the perfect, you know, plug to go into exactly. that bottom. I mean, there's just nowhere to maneuver, really, especially if he's got forces placed on both flanks, which he very intelligently does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And south of so, these cruisers are the destroyers, which are just yeah. deadly in this event. Uh, the yeah. destroyers would hug the shoreline trying to hide themselves from Japanese radar. They would try and camouflage themselves amongst the coast there to stay out of sight. Uh, the first to come into contact with Nishimura would be the plywood PT boats that we were referring to earlier, however, of which there were dozens, actually 39, deployed and ready to go. These little vessels would launch torpedo attacks, but more than anything else, they would act as scouts reporting on Nishimura's advance and the status of his formation as the battle develops. The Japanese, if they made it up the strait and passed the PTs and destroyers, uh, the literal school of, tor of torpedoes that the destroyers would launch would be met by a wall of radar-directed rapid fire from the American and Australian cruisers before the battleships would theoretically deliver the coup de grace. Pretty straightforward plan. I mean, it's about as easy as you can get, and, and it's about as simple as you can get. And like you said, John, I mean, the the terrain for you know yeah. is is dictating every single thing that's going to go around here, and. Oldendorf's got that massive plug in that bottle, just like you were talking about. Ammunition is something we need to talk about because this comes into play a little bit here in just a bit. Ammunition specifically for the battleships was a bit of a problem. Oldendorf's ships, which were almost always employed as shore bombardment vessels, were loaded with a large amount of HE shells, which won't do a whole hell of a lot against, them, against Japanese battleships. They were loaded with 77% HE to 23% AP to be exact, just before the operation began. Oldendorf's six battle wagons had roughly 1,600 AP rounds between them and roughly the same in AG after, after having bombarded targets all week long. Well, and 1,600 rounds does sound like a lot of ammunition, but as you are going to see, yeah. it really, it's really not yeah, you, that you much. You can fire a lot of that off in a pretty short amount of time. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I was intrigued actually by that percentage because that's, that's sort of, the, the mirror image of what you would tend to see in, in a battleship loadout, which would be predominantly armor piercing and just a, you know, a smattering of HE if you needed it. But yeah, yeah given the mission of these particular ships, that that's perfectly logical. And that's the key. That's the key. Go ahead, Tony. I wanted to mention to, to touch back on it just for a moment, because it's part of the setup as it unfolds. The terrain on the terrain question, the American battleship battle line is also having to mine the terrain the narrowness of the strait that John talked about, they're doing it, what amounts to a continual loop mm -hmm. like this at a pretty slow speed, You're close to 12 knots or so at times. They'd speed up as they needed to or thought they saw torpedoes or something. But they're kind of doing yeah. this motion back and forth. And they're always having to do a complicated simultaneous turn as they reach the end of the space on each yeah. side. And more than once, it could nearly lead to a collision. But so they're doing this, and they'll be doing that even during the gunfire battle. West Virginia had scraped her her uh, underwater hull and apparently dinged the propeller or something on October 21. So she was reduced to 16 knots. Wow. She have higher speed than that. The, she wouldn't need it in this battle, but that might have influenced why Whaler didn't transfer his flag to her. In other words, it's a ship more limited capability, even though it's the best one for a lot of reasons. Uh, so I wanted to mention that in case yeah. that was realized about West Virginia uh, and the terrain thing about how they're using it, that the same with the cruisers, the left and right flank cruisers. Yep. Are the same Got thing. a patrol line and they're just going, yeah, circular around it. There, so there's also a little island at the very top of the strait too that, that they had to be careful of. They couldn't get too close to that because it's going to mm -hmm. obscure their gunfire. And so that means that the battleship force needs to be basically in the western part of the channel 
uh, in order to not mask their own gunfire by by that island. But anyway, yeah, nerding out on details. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all about the details, baby. All about the details. So, <laughs> as a result of the ammunition, I don't want to call it a shortage, but a dis uh, disparity. <laughs> let's let's call it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Oldendorf issues an order that states to his battleships they would not open fire until the enemy approached to within seventeen to twenty thousand yards, which is pretty friggin' close for for a battleship to to start letting loose with their main battery. Uh, at that range, Oldendorf was confident that his battle wagons would be more accurate with their heavy shells, and the valuable rounds would not be wasted with ineffective shooting, and believe me, they aren't. And while the ammo was fine for one battle, if the battle became prolonged, or, and this is key for later, if the battleships had to fight another battle, ammunition could potentially be a serious issue. Yeah. So guys, as the battle approaches, Oldendorf and his ships are ready, to say the least. They knew the Japanese were coming, they knew from which direction, and they were confident in their shooting, radar, and composition. If everything went right, Surigao Strait would be less of a battle and more of a nautical execution. And I don't think that's an overstatement. I really don't. That's exactly what it is. I, one of the things that strikes me, I mean, we, we talk about this, of course, as a battleship action, but Really, at the end of the day, it is Oldendorf's massive superiority in light forces that is the telling factor here because, you know, they're, they're going to whittle the Japanese well down to size before the, you know, the big girls can e even open up. And that, oh, yeah. So let's let's start with the littlest of them, right? <laughs> let's get to it. So, yeah. Bill, at 1950, Oldendorf receives a message from Desron 54s, and this is incredibly important. From Desron's 54 CO, Captain J.G. Coward. Tell us about what goes down here. Yep. <clears throat> Admiral Hiroshio Oldendorf on HMS Victory tell, orders the fleet to tack into the wind and uncover the broadsides. As the unfortunately named Captain Coward, Desron, <laughs> Desron was not part of Oldendorf's original battle plan. His squadron was not assigned to Oldendorf's bombardment units. So Coward overhearing the TBS and surmising that a serious surface battle was soon in the offing, took the initiative and inserted himself. This is a big deal. Inserted yeah. himself into Oldendorf's plans. He received, received a message that read, in case of surface contact to southward, I plan to make an immediate torpedo attack and then retire to clear you. With your approval, I will submit plans shortly. Needless to say, Oldendorf happily approves, as Coward had not been counted on initially, and his destroyers now added even more firepower to the coming ambush. So you got the PT boats that can, you know, attack with torpedoes, and a destroyer squadron that can attack with torpedoes. Seth, as, as John said, this should do good work here, right? Oh, big yeah, time. I, I I'm reminded of of Nelson's uh, quote that no captain can do very wrong if he lays his ship alongside that of an enemy. I mean, like, and close and the enemy. Close yeah, the exactly. enemy. So we got Captain Coward showing up with his Desron and saying, you know, I'm going to do this. And of course, Holden Norris is like, you're my kind of guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And this clearly holds to that. <laughs> yeah. As we're going to and see, delivers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big mm -hmm. time, big time, yeah. and and we'll get we'll get to the details of that. But I mean, Coward's force, debatably, you know, arguably is pretty much the most decisive force in yeah. this battle. But we'll get there. We'll get cool. there. Uh, he would attack in two, Coward would attack in two groups from two sides and hopefully slip some fish into Nishimura's ships before they ever knew what hit him. Uh, his destroyers would approach at high speed, 30 knots. Actually, they don't, but regardless of this, and would fire torpedoes only. He is a student of the Guadalcanal campaign. He knows full well that to not fire guns, do not give away your position with your muzzle flashes, just fire the fish, only shoot if you absolutely have to, and keep themselves hidden from Japanese return fire. Now, guys, Tony, John, can you guys give us an estimation of what Nishimura was expecting to encounter as he's going to proceed up this straight? What is he thinking is going to be up there waiting for him, if well, anything at, at all? That moment, at that particular moment, what he's expecting is he's expecting batches of torpedo boats, PT boats, and destroyers. He is expecting destroyers. 
the latest information he had from the complaint from Cebu had shown none of the battleships they had seen earlier. They'd apparently withdrawn eastward. Even Ugaki believed that. The late, so the latest Japanese intelligence as dust came was that the, Jap, the battleship forces that the Megami search plane had sighted earlier had moved east out of Leyte Gulf. But really what it was is, it, is Oldendorf doing the complicated maneuvering to get around that island John mentioned? Mm -hmm. Get around that island and then get the battle line tucked into its ambush position. But by the motion that went out to the east for a while, the Japanese thought they'd left the, left the strait uncovered. So uh, they were expecting at that time only PT boats and destroyers. Right. And if you've got a pair of battleships and a heavy cruiser along with you're not you, really worried be, about those. Right. You should be Especially able to fight. The crack destroyer squadron like this, Division 4. Right. So, as expected, no surprise here, the PT boats are the very first guys, Americans, to encounter Nishimura's force. And the van of the Japanese column was the Mogami and two destroyers. The two battleships and destroyer Shigure trailed behind the lead ships. Nishimura had sent Megami ahead to see what may be in store for his force as it entered the strait. At 22.36, PT-131, skippered by Ensign Peter Gad, picked up Nishimura's force on his radar set. Almost instantly, three PTs open throttle, raced across the water at the Japanese, flying along at about 24 knots. I say flying because PTs could actually get a hell of a lot faster than that. Faster at 20, that. yeah, big time. <laughs> at 22, good. Yeah. You, you don't want to because, no. you know, one of the reasons that Coward Squadron is at lower speed too, high speed creates big wakes and exactly. bow waves, and those are visible, yeah. especially to uh, lookouts of the caliber that the Japanese can boast. And so, mm -hmm. really, even in a PT boat, you're going to try to do your best to sneak in before you, you launch your fish, and then you're going to gun the engines and get the hell out of Dodge. And that is, is, that is precisely what happens here. And at night, it's bioluminescence, and during the daytime, of course, you could still see those wakes on radar. Right. Right. So at 22.52, Japanese lookouts aboard, Sh aboard Shigure saw the PTs headed for their column and began to open fire. So ironically enough, the first shots of Surigao Strait are fired by the Japanese. Gad's radar picture clarifies when his initial two blips spread out into five as he neared Nishimura. In the darkness, he could make out the shapes of the two towering pagoda masts of the two Japanese battleships, two cruisers, and another destroyer. As the PTs race in, the Japanese fired star shells, and Yamashiro's secondary battery, secondary battery opens fire on the Americans. The PTs were taken under pretty intense Japanese and somewhat accurate Japanese shell fire. Bill, uh, what's going on in the ensuing catfight that goes on out here? <clears throat> Melee? Yeah, well, the PTs yeah. made slashing attacks along the Japanese surface forces under intense Japanese fire, illuminated by those star shells most of the time, as one of the boats, BT-152, made its attack on Shigure. The latter's searchlight snapped on, illuminating, illuminating 152 for all the world to see. Being chased down by Shigure, 152 seemed like a goner, and she was already hit and damaged with some dead crew. 152 skipper ordered his 40 millimeter gun crew to take out Shigura's searchlight in an effort to escape. This is not easy when you're going fast in any boat, bouncing along. You know, you, 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 in right. TV, they make it look easy. It is not. PT 130 slid in behind 152 and laid smoke to help out as 152 boats 40 millimeter hammered away at Shigura's light. Suddenly, the night went black again for the 152 boat and she escaped with no further damage as either the light was cut off or it was actually shot out by the fleeing pt i was just going to say i mean uh if, if we're within bofors range of these japanese vessels and we course. ourselves of course are within 25 millimeter anti-aircraft range of the japanese ships so you mm -hmm. know there's there's a lot of light uh ack -ack that's being thrown around in this engagement because the ranges are that close and, and that's, you know, that's something that, that in, in your mind's eye, when you picture that, the, the, the close proximity, talk about hair raising. I mean, yeah. this, these are plywood vessels attacking Japanese battleships and cruisers and destroyers at, you know, spitball range when it comes yeah. to automatic mm -hmm. weapons fire. I mean, this is this is friggin close. So the remainder of the PT boat attacks against Nishimura went 
kind of similar to 152's escapade. Uh, close encounters with Japanese destroyers and secondary battleships, secondary batteries of battleships, caused all of the torpedoes fired by the American PTs to miss their intended targets at this time. Now, I know, Tony, you want to get to this in just a second. Uh, but what the PT attacks lacked in damage inflicted, they scored in reporting enemy position and track, albeit the latter information arriving in Oldendorf's hands an hour and a half after the initial combat had begun. Needless mm -hmm. to say, nevertheless, Oldendorf is aware that his enemy is indeed coming up the straight, and he's getting ready to make ready for them. Now, the PTs had done their job. Did they inflict any damage on Nishimura's force initially? No, not really. But, Tony, they do, the PTs do later, we're jumping a little bit ahead of time, do inflict some damage on Shima, don't they? Yes. Uh, by this time, Shima had gotten his force assigned to go in, to uh, Leyte Gulf right behind Nishimura, but in a totally separate force because he was a tie. He was originally assigned to carry a, a group of troops down to reinforce Leyte, Leyte Island uh, and didn't want that assignment. He managed to get his ships assigned to join, to follow Nishimura in. They weren't more closely coordinated, but, but it's kind of misunderstood that it wasn't in Shima and Nishimura's power to coordinate with each other. That's something Karita needed to do from his seniority or Toyota above them. As C and C a combined fleet. Nishimura and Shima couldn't could hardly not talk to each other because they're not even aware of what the other's doing, except for an occasional mention of radio silence. But it turned out Shima is about by this time is and actually, behind. I was just gonna for the sake of our our listeners here, so we've got two Japanese forces. We've got Nishimura's force that's come that's up from from Brunei that's built around the battleships, right? And then there's this other guy we just started talking about, a guy named Shima who is centered on a, a single heavy cruiser, uh, the Mogami. Two? Oh, yeah. Not not, sure. Hello. Um, so, so and and originally, uh, Shima's force actually comes down from the north, does it not? And yeah. it, Right. And so these two forces have, have met, and now they're not really operating together. They're just sort of in the same neighborhood, and Shima is trailing along in Nishimura's wake with his two heavy cruisers and other light combatants. So just wanted to yep. throw that out here for me. They're both shown here. So while Shima comes right. from the north, he's entering, this is the dotted line here, he's entering the channel uh, essentially along the same axis right. that the southern force was at entering. Right. And so to cover what Seth was alluding to is, so when Shima comes in doing the same thing Nishimura had done just about an hour before, when Shima comes in, he does get hit by a PT boat torpedo when they do the same thing to it. They attack his force the exact same way. They hit the light cruiser of Bukuma with a, a torpedo that cripples her and makes her fall out of formation, where the two heavy cruisers, Nachi and Ashigura, have to go on with destroyers alone. So the PT boats did get a score then, a little bit later in the battle. That's yeah. all. Uh, of the 39 boats that were in the strait, talking about attacking Nishimura, 30 were able to deliver torpedo attacks and launch 34 fish in the water. Um, <clears throat> 10 PT boats were hit, and only one was lost to enemy fire. Three Americans had been killed, and a further 20 had been wounded aboard the PTs. Now, guys, on the Japanese side of things, Nishimura had run the gauntlet of PTs and emerged relatively unscathed, and still in some sort of formation. As his force moves through the last of the PTs, Southern Force was set to face a far more formidable threat than the PT boats, though. Can uh, you guys, was he expecting a destroyer attack at this point? Tossing it to you, Tony. You wrote the book, baby. <laughs> no, at this point, he's <laughs> expecting more of the same. In fact, as the torpedo attacks come from cowards' destroyers, the Japanese think it's more of the same. Torpedo boats firing from longer range to protect themselves. They, it takes a little while to realize they're destroyed. Now, Fuso does. Fuso spots Melvin and they engage in a fight that you'll see. But uh, but from Nishimura's perspective, he doesn't realize their destroyers attacking him right away. Unless, and this should be allowed for it, because with the translations, it can be tricky. He says, we're proceeding while engaging and destroying enemy torpedo boats. Given the translation, it may be the torpedo boat he's using for the word destroyer. It can be tricky. It doesn't right. mean that, that's something that right. needs to be allowed for. But he's definitely not thinking in terms of cruisers or battleships yet. Yeah. He's aware and, of this. This actually starts to, to bring out a thing that we're going to see in the later parts of the battle 
Um, Nishimura is on the flagship, which is Yamashiro, which is up at the front of the force. Uso is behind him. And as the battle goes on, you're going to see Nishimura is increasingly unaware of what is happening to Fuso. And it's just, he's more focused on what's, you know, coming up <laughs> rather than what's happening over his shoulder. Uh, and that's going to be problematic for Fuso. Well, as interesting and as fascinating as it is, and because we all know what's coming up next, we're not going to talk about that in this episode. We're going to stop because we've got so much detail we want to discuss. This is part one of Surigao Strait. I'm going to cut the conversation here. And guys, if you're listening and or watching, tune in next week for the remainder of Surigao Strait because it's about to get really, it's gonna get really real. <laughs> juicy. It's going to get juicy. Guys, yeah. is there anything you want to add in before we wrap this episode up before next week's episode when we get to the to the main event. Is there anything else you guys want to throw in here? Tony, you yes. look like you uh, do. The PT Bolt attack that has just concluded. One thing to notice, it was so bravely and courageously conducted. I mean, it's straight out of a Hollywood movie. It really was. Well, you're not kidding. I mean, it really is. But what was most lacking, and it had Oldendorf been standing over their shoulder, he would have been rolling his eyes and doing all this. What absolutely was lacking was them reporting the Japanese fleet first. Their orders were to report, then attack report, then attack. They attacked so fast that most of them got crippled and got their radios knocked out. They almost got into a situation where they failed to notify Oldendorf. Mm -hmm. It was a quick thinking of one of the PT boats whose radio is knocked out. He's going, oh shit, I need to figure out. Something. So he barreled north at maximum speed, on opened the gun on his PT boat to an intact group of PT boats that hadn't yet attacked and said, radio Oldendorf, the following information. And that's how Oldendorf got it. Oh, wow. So it's kind of funny because the same phenomenon often would sometimes happen with American submarines. They would attack for, and Japanese submarines, absolutely. Both of them were, were, had a tendency to attack first rather than radio because that's so, the Philippines had an important exception to that. They'd attack first, and if they were held down too long, they didn't get the report out. Here you see it happening with the PT boats, the enthusiasm to attack. They also got damaged enough where they couldn't report it. They almost weren't able to. So that's that's an important thing as we lead into the next one. Realize that Oldendorf, he has his information, he's ready, but not, but he easily might not have. Yeah. Right. And it takes a long time for him to get that message. It's yeah. over 90 Probably minutes before for he gets that message. Yeah. Some degree, but, I, but some of it's, I don't know why it took as long as it did, because even allowing the delay of relaying to another PT boat. Yeah. Yeah. As, as we left you last week, the PT boats had just finished their attack and they had just hold away and that the true fighting portion of this battle is about to start when the American destroyers get into the fray here. Guys, um guy we mentioned last last week was a gentleman named Captain Coward, which is a very unfortunate last name because this guy is literally anything okay. but his Desron 54 is speeding its way south right for Nishimura. Coward had arrayed his destroyers, as we, as you will recall from last week, in two columns parallel to one another with the intention of enveloping the Japanese on two flanks as Coward's destroyers spread south and Nishimura sped north. Sped. <laughs> but it, regardless, the two forces sighted each other at a distance of five miles almost simultaneously. Coward's eastern column was coming in head-on and laid smoke to blur the Japanese vision. Bill, take us through some of this early destroyer action here at Surigao Strait. What's going on here? Well, through the smoke screen, Seth, the Japanese could see Coward's column as it came on. The Japanese opened fire, missing wildly, which is unusual. Some of their shell splashes landing more than some 2,000 yards short of their targets than bracketed them yet. Even though they had been slight, sighted visually, Coward's ships were in a radar shadow zone off the East Coast, and off the East Coast of the Western Island, and were thus invisible to Japanese radar. According, as we might also call it ground clutter in radar parlance. According to those shipboard, aboard Shigure, the frustrated Japanese could not distinguish the Americans from the shore, and therefore could see as cowards 
and therefore could not see as Coward's ships roared in. I'm not reading as well as I was reading last week, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> last week? Ten last minutes ago, you yeah. mean? <laughs> It's all relative, man. It's fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese do obviously respond. They open fire on what they thought might be American ships, again, missing badly. Uh, Coward's destroyers, like his plan had stated, held their gunfire. You remember this is this is a tactic of American destroyers that was you know developed out of the Guadalcanal campaign. We see a lot of this off the Solomon Islands in 43. Um, at 0300, Coward's destroyers unleash their fish. His eastern column fired 27 torpedoes and, torpedoes, and then they turn away. Japanese lookouts, however, spotted the torpedoes inbound and attempted to evade. As the Americans retreated, and this is first blood here, well, technically not, but it's first blood on the Japanese here, Fuso sighted them and opened fire with her main battery. Star shells lit the night and illuminated the Americans as they pulled away the battleship. Fuso scores no hits, and in almost exactly the same time as she opens fire, she absorbs at least two, possibly three torpedoes from USS Melvin. Tony, you had wanted to talk about Melvin and Fuso getting into a little bit of a scrape here. Can you elaborate on this action here for us? Yeah, so what had happened is that as the, as, as the destroyers were inbound to, about to launch the torpedoes, they were sighted by a Japanese, partly from the role of overhead, overhead flares that were up and, and uh, visual sightings and Fuso had time to turn her main batteries and, look, and open fire on Melvin. And some some uh, survivors, meaning uh, uh, veterans of Melvin, told me that, you know, they'd straddle, straddle the destroyer up. And it was very scary for just, you know, a few crazy moments the way it is in battle until the torpedoes were seen to hit Fuso. Flares on uh, Fuso, at least two, maybe three. What's interesting about that is that if there's definitely a torpedo hit under the forward turrets on the starboard bow, there's another midships of some kind because it's where we'll kind of buckle and show damage as she's foundering later. We'll get into that. So it appears to have been in the boiler rooms right behind the pagoda mast. There may have been a third hit, but I, at this time, I don't think so. Uh, so it's probably two torpedo hits, slows Fuso down to 10 knots and starts her listing to starboard. Uh, but she continues after Yamashua for this time. These t this time is around 309. So these are torpedoes that were fired from the eastern side of the strait. You're about to describe coward's destroyers firing also from the western side of the strait. But this is the state of the action at this point. Uh, no one seems, other than the cruiser Megami, is falling directly behind Fuso. Yamashiro doesn't see Fuso hit by torpedoes or hear from her. And it appear, apparently it's because the forward generator room is one of those things flooded and knocks out her internal communications. So she's not able to telegram Yamashiro right away at all, in fact. So, she continues on. Go ahead, John. You were going to say something? No, no. That's clear. My oh. Oh, okay. So almost immediately after Fuso is hit, Megami, as you were saying, Tony, slides into column behind Yamashiro. Nishimura riding in the aforementioned battleship was completely unaware that Fuso had fallen out of line and was in desperate trouble. Can can you talk about some of this damage that she suffers? These torpedoes fired from Melvin, uh, which is, by the way, DD-680. Uh, these do some pretty serious damage to Fuso here, right, Tony? I mean, they they put a pretty pretty nasty lick on this battleship. Yes. Uh, if you go back to the air attack, remember that it, one of the bomb hits by the forward turrets penetrated all the way down to a lower deck. And that had probably weakened some structural integrity in that very area. Well, the, the forward torpedo hit goes in under the forward turrets. We have survivors from both uh, number one, number two turret areas. Uh, and starts heavy flooding in the bow that is so severe that within about 10, 12 minutes, Fuso's bow is submerging where the waves are being parted by number one turret. I mean, it is going down. You probably described it in your segment before. When Masashi's bow was submerging, right. it's a lot like that. The forecastle was down and like that from massive flooding forward. Mm -hmm. And I believe the bomb damage had added to this. It's, I suspect it did because it had done some underwater damage up back the day before. So at this point, you have Fuso basically submerging her bow, leaning more and more to starboard and kind of nosing down, but still making about 10 knots, trying to follow Yamashiro, stay in column at the moment. 
Uh, How you're going to do that with your bow underwater yeah. is you know, yeah. open to fact, they, they swing the turrets, they secure the turrets, they swing them forward again. So she's under sufficient control in that sense, and the bow steadily settling. Uh, but it probably the the actual submerging probably takes a few more minutes because initially she does follow your mouse, so she's still in formation when the next attack happens. But she is in bad shape, and for some reason. Fuso does not notify Yamashiro or anybody what happened, but Megami saw what happened and passed her when she slowed down. Uh, but contrary to some previous conceptions, it's not because there are big fires raging aboard or anything like that. She's basically she's basically getting water off, right. uh, and communications can be knocked out for almost the, you know for any, almost any reason. You know they they use the tubes back then the. Uh, in the radio voice tubes, tubes. Yeah. so yeah. the shock voice tubes or yeah, radio right. tubes, yeah, that, sir. yeah. So it's easy right. enough to explain why communications got cut off, uh, but that, it's not a sign of a react out of action yet. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, the, the classic rendition of Fuso's thinking, uh, you know, the the one I grew up with as a kid was mm -hmm. that she she broke in half. And that both of her halves were, you know, floating along and on fire for a long time. And I got to tell you, even as a kid, that didn't make a damn bit of sense to me. Because, again, if you look at, you know, the, the size of this ship's superstructure, if this puppy breaks in half, she's going over, you know. Yeah. So yeah. even though it didn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. And as Tony discovered, that's actually one of the big revisions from his book and a, a very important one that there was not Fuso's demise is not a fiery one. It's a watery one. She's just, mm -hmm. she, again, she's an older combatant. She cannot resist this sort of underwater damage. And as a result of that, there's massive flooding in her forward part and she's going down. Yeah. Can, can you guys gonna... just go, go ahead, Bill. Go ahead. You know, what I would say is just trying to stay in formation while she's submerging reminds me of the old submarine joke. Any ship can be a submarine once. <laughs> right. Right. That's right. right. It's very true. That is very and the true. The other thing to realize here is the other hit was clearly a boiler room hit. And that's why she slowed down to 10 knots. They've lost some of their steam power. But clearly her engines remained in operation. And though it's getting ahead of the story, her propellers are still turning when she sinks. So mm -hmm. well let let let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about her sinking, and and don't worry about the about the about the time you know oh. out of context or whatever. But oh, let's let's okay. talk about her sinking here. Uh, what okay. what happens? So she fought, tries to follow the the force up straight. During the next attack, when they all evade to the right, Fuso turns right with them. That's the last time she's under real control. Because after that, she starts slowly circling back south and slowing down and. And what, what we learned for the survivors, what's happening is she's listing more and more to starboard and starting to corkscrew. You probably remember about the Titanic. It started to go right and left as you start to lose start to lose uh, stability when you get to that negative stability point from so much flooding and when her bow submerges. What happens is around 340, she submerges the bow entirely. The strain causes the, to buckle a little behind the pagoda. And it literally pitches the giant 44 meter pagoda overboard. And then she buckles and d noses down where her stern comes up, where the propellers are still turning, and goes down. So you battleship sunk by just destroyed torpedoes alone, and with some help from the bomb the day before. Uh, goes down at 0340 ish around that time. Uh, we know that time more from the American accounts, but the uh, the best Japanese survivor also estimated 40 minutes after being hit is when Fuso sank, capsized mm -hmm. the starboard and sank. Uh, so the pagoda has fallen overboard with a great crash. Uh, this will matter that later, but um, it's fallen over with a great crash. Then the buckled wreck, but still in one piece. This is crucial. It's what John was alluding to. She did not break in half, let alone two halves fall down. Still in one piece, kind of jackknife. She breaks in half and sinks. Her bow may have even hit the bottom of the straight. She has a link to it. So maybe that's where the buckling happens. Mm -hmm. But here's what happens next. Because of the buckle, a huge, massive spill of her fuel oil happens. And that, for some reason, maybe just bending her sparks or something, catches fire almost immediately and forms a giant bonfire around the sinking stern. Okay, 
uh, for what for just a few minutes, the stern is still sticking up, surrounded by all this bonfire flames, and you can see the propellers. And then she sings. Turns out she was forced to be able to see that, you know, confuse the hell out of it, because they're right. arriving from the south just as Lucy was sinking. That's what's not been really understood. That might yeah. be a good point. So. Yeah. Ugly. So, and, and, and bad for the survivors of the water is what I was going to say, too. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, one said roasting like beans. Yeah. yeah, that's an ugly image. And obviously anybody that was in the pagoda uh, superstructure, when it gets uh, launched over the side of the ship, essentially, that that's not a good look either. So, yeah, the, the net result is that the, the crew account or the crew complement numbers are all over the map. I've seen figures between 1600 and 1900, but only 10 of these guys are going to survive at the end of the day. So this is really, really wow. ugly. This, yeah. It's a Titanic is what it is. Yeah. Jesus. Of yeah. That isn't, that is insane. Yeah. yeah. 10 survivors from the crew of the battleship. That's yeah. not quite, but very close to hood esque. Right. Yeah. Really. And we're just about really to get is. it again. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it. We ain't done. We ain't, we done. ain't done. Thank nope. you, Captain Coward. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, man, he delivers right here. I tell you, his other destroyers also get into the fight. Specifically, one at zero three ten USS McDermott DD six seven seven and USS Monson DD seven ninety eight unleash their torpedoes. Twenty torpedoes head for Nishimura's force, and he rightly ordered evasive action. Failing to hold his evasive action maneuvers long enough, however, the American fish connected with their targets. Three torpedoes fired by McDermott hit destroyer Yamagumo, eviscerating the ship, absolutely destroying her, sinking her in three minutes. Another McDermott torpedo hits Michio amidships, causing that destroyer to go dead in the water. She sank about 15 minutes later. Yet another McDermott torpedo scored when Asagumo was hit in her bow. McDermott salvo was the most successful American destroyer strike of the entire war. Now, now, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. This is a five, this is a, a quintuple mount, right? Yeah, but she has two yes. of them. But she's got she has two of them. Ten, so yeah. she shoots 10 torpedoes with five known hits. Yeah. Yes. That's good shooting in anybody's book. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Especially when you consider what torpedoes didn't do earlier in the war. This is rather amazing. So true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we no have kidding. solved our torpedo problems. Yes, <laughs> we, have, we have fixed the sploders. The sploders yeah, now work. Yeah. Big time, big time. Not to be outdone, USS Monson scored when her torpedoes hit Yam Yamashiro on her port quarter at 0322. Yamashiro's captain flooded her magazines for turrets five and six as to render them impervious to the fire inside her. Uh, Tony, what is this damage that, that the battleship suffers right here? Can you get into that a little bit? Can you get into some detail here? What happened is uh, when Monson's torpedo hit the port quarter, a fire broke out. I'm not exactly even sure why the, the survivors didn't make clear of, but they made clear that there was a there was a threat to the aft magazines enough for the captain ordered them flooded at the lower level as a precaution. The turrets remained operational, but they would have to make do with what they had loaded. Uh, but it didn't. But Mermasho goes out of her way to signal it does. It's no impediment to battle cruising. Doesn't even slow her down. The flooding of the magazines was just a precaution. Uh, this sal What's interesting about this salvo is it's in the same salvo that, as he described, had just taken out th three Japanese destroyers. And the division flagship of, the, of Division 4, Mission Shields, the division flagship. And not only is it a, a big score, this is actually removing the Japanese' best offensive power torpedo attack from them all in one blow. It mm. cannot be... It's impossible to overstate the importance of this torpedo attack. You alluded to in the first segment that actually Coward's attack may have been the most decisive of the battle. It seems like it is. I mean, by any measure, because sank a battleship outright. That's Fusa. Uh, sank two destroyers outright, Yamagumo and Mishishio. Uh, Asagumo crippled, though, though in the most battle sense of the word, Asagumo remains in battle. She even fires a torpedo, so she's not out of action. But that's the situation you have. Their greatest offensive power is already deprived of them just when they're going to need it, when more destroyer attacks 
lay ahead, let alone any chance of firing it on the Darth Cruises of battleships. Right. It's it's it really is incredible. So, Bill, break it down for us. Uh, cowards dead. Go, go ahead, Tony. Go ahead, Tony. For the mention, uh, Monson or McDermott. It's probably Monson giving the angle. May have got a hit on Fuso too. On her port quarter, okay. there's an unexplained torpedo hole. What looks like a torpedo hole. Uh, that's the only time you didn't really think it would have happened is when they all were broadside turning right to avoid Monson McDermott's attack. Maybe she pegged Fuso on the starboard in the port quarter at the same time. And that accounts for seeming to circle after that before she sinks. Mm -hmm. Tony, you're talking about when they discovered the wreck in 2017. Mm -hmm. Did they, they discover that at all? Right. Found, found she's jackknifed on the bottom in kind of a switchblade form with the bow section pointing north and the stern section pointing southwest, kind of in a switchblade form. Pagoda's north of that. Well, there's a there's what I mean a big hole, so it looks like a torpedo hole. It doesn't look like structural collapse or anything. In the port quarter, you see it in the Drain the Oceans episode that talks about blue stuff too. Uh, mm. The so um, I haven't had time to study that in detail yet, but the only attack that seems to fit is the Monson McDermott attack. Maybe the kill and the run to be able to attack a little later could have also flicked through the decks, but it's just worth mentioning. They may have scored even more than drill lost. It, it's incredible because, I mean, again, keep in mind, for those watching and or listening, Coward was never even a part of Oldendorf's initial plan. Coward inserts right. himself you know, and, and was, and was welcomed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was welcomed by Oli, but he wasn't even a part of the initial plan. And here he comes in here with his guys. And, I mean, they just absolutely lay waste to the Japanese. Bill, can you summarize what Desron 54 and then later Desron 24, what do they do? This Because the destroyers aren't done here. Mm -hmm. No, they're not. And again, Deseron 54 was the one here to the east. And we're going to talk about Deseron 24 to the west in a moment. And both of these attacks, are, they're sequential, but they're, you know, destroyers in both. So 54's attack was, even though, as you said, Seth, they weren't part of the original plan, was brilliant in execution and results. In a squadron's attack, they had sunk Fuso, Yamagumo, and Mich uh, Michisio while damaging Asagumo heavily and putting hits on Yamashiro, Coward's aggressive command and his planning and execution were a thing of beauty and honestly was the killing blow of the fight before the big ships even got into the scuffle. Now, Desron 24, this is a different squadron, launched their attack on the western side of the channel at the severely depleted Japanese formation. By now, only Yamashiro, Mogami, and Shigure were in formation. Like Coward's group before them, Desron 24 attacked in two separate formations, two lines abreast in essence. At 0331, USS Killen, which was DD-593, launched torpedoes, of which you know, some of those deep torpedoes hit Yamashiro port side amidships. The hit slowed Yamashiro to a crawl at five knots, although her damage control parties eventually got her back up to 18 knots in short order. So this is already starting to turn into another conflagration, Seth. Yeah. And Tony, you had something you wanted to say about uh, Yamashiro's speed. That, that this 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 hit, it, it's near one of her uh, boiler rooms, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. It went into an engine room, not the boiler the room. room. So this is, yeah. At the time, uh, all, the, all the accounts knew that Yamashiro had slowed to almost five knots after that torpedo hit, uh, but then built up speed again, as Bill said, uh, to 18 knots again pretty quick. So it was a pretty fast recovery, but with so little information available, even the, you know, the few survivors, most of them were forward or midships, uh, didn't really know uh, what had happened. The wreck now reveals where the torpedo was. In other words, so it's more under the main mast area so it's an engine room hit, boiler mm -hmm. room hit or engine room hit. Either one would have accounted for what we see. But now yeah. we can kind of say what happened. She lost the use of one of her port engines, maybe both, uh, but is able to crank up on the starboard once again to back to 18 knots uh, and does. Uh, what's interesting is there may have been another torpedo hit on the port bow at the same time because Megami claimed the torpedo hit was on the port bow. The wreck shows a very damaged bow that's even mm -hmm. buckled. But it's not mentioned, and it's not mentioned afterward. It's just a, it's a product of Nagami's report, and the wreck. Hmm. 
Well, I mean, you, you can you can understand that if some, some not everything's going to be recorded when there's utter yeah. chaos yeah, aboard these the ships at this present time. Not a thinking reporter, anyway. yeah. just a few survivors. So she is going to be hit. Yamashiro is going to be hit by another torpedo at zero four zero seven near her starboard engine room, and two During more from gunfire. you. At, say again. During the gunfire battle. Yeah. Right, right. And then two more from USS Newcomb DD-586 hit her at 0411 on her starboard side. Uh, these final attacks, as you were saying, were made by the U.S. destroyers just as the gunnery portion of the fight is beginning. Now, I put this in the notes, and I would love to hear you guys riff on this. Fuso goes down by two torpedoes, possibly three. Yamashiro absorbs a lot, and we'll, we'll get to the gunfire here in just a minute. Why the discrepancy in the two sisters when one goes down with a whimper and the other one goes down fighting like a lion? What 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 the heck happened here? Any idea? Uh, for my for my take, I think it's because Fuso's Fuso had cumulative damage from that bomb hit multiplied by that torpedo hit. I think it's kind okay. of sinister and hasn't been recognized. Hmm. Uh, that with a flooded forecastle, as Masashi's experience shows, things get really messy and unstable pretty quick especially for a ship of the Fuso's age, she's leaking and stuff from the torpedo hits, even in undamaged compartments, wartight integrity. Uh, those may be familiar with it at, at Pearl Harbor, the Nevada partly founders after the attack of Pearl, Pearl Harbor, surely from just progressive flooding, getting through conduits and weakened wartight doors and stuff, well beyond the damage area. Well, I think something like that's happening on Fuso's forecastle area. She also has a hit in the boiler room area, which floods that whole wet you know, near the near under the stack. So if she does have a third torpedo it added just a little bit later to the stern, that's gonna create a lot of this kind of stuff and flooding on both ends. Yeah. Uh, Yamashiro's behavior later, uh so far we see until she's sunk, until she's hit by torpedoes right before the end, notice that the only really hard serious hit is the one in the engine room. But an engine room can absorb damage. It just gets knocked out. Uh, so in a way, I think Yamashiro's damage is less threatening to her till the gunfire battle torpedo hits, the ones that do finish her off. Let John uh, tie in on somebody. No, I wasn't going to say anything else. I mean, the only thing I'm thinking Equity. about here is, um, like, if, if you look at the, the opening stages of the war when Prince of Wales and Repulse were sunk, oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, Repulse was a very handy uh, vessel and was able to evade a number of the torpedo attacks that were, you know, you know these are aerial torpedoes being dropped against her. But I tell you what, when when uh, I, I think it's Genzan group finally connected with Repulse, she thinks right now, you know, because, again, ships of this vintage just really didn't have the ability to absorb underwater damage. Um it, 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 so yeah, Yamashiro yeah, gets kind of lucky here in that she takes one in the engine room and you know she's able to absorb that in a sense. Fuso taking her damage so far forward, probably outside of the protective, uh, the armored box, means that you get this asymmetric trim on the front, much like what we see happening in Musashi. I'm, I got a ton of water in my bow and I, I can't, I, I just can't absorb it. It's over. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's rather astonishing that one can take such a beating and the other one just kind of yeah down flops she goes. over and dies right yeah yeah it anyway. really is so um, before we get to what everybody wants to hear of course which is the gunfight talk about the yeah I mean let's be real talk talk, talk about the J Japanese formation guys what is what what does it look like right now what is Nishimura's formation if there is one, it's, it's, what it's, is it yeah, it's, like? hardly, it's hardly worthy of the name of a formation. I mean, he's down to three ships, and one of them is Actually already. Four. Oh, that's right. You're right. You're right. Because yeah, yeah Oskubo still with him. Oskubo still is still floating for the time being. Um, but in terms of any sort of cohesion, I mean, you know, Shima's force was never really coordinated with his either. And and yeah, at this point, Nishimura's got, you know, a badly damaged battleship and Shigure. I mean, and he he has no idea what what is lying in wait for him just up just up this straight. Tony, yeah. anything on it? Uh it also bears in mind of uh, adding to that is uh Nishimura had sent a signal all ships proceed independently to the attack. He was mm -hmm. aware that the formation was shattered. So you have 
Yamashiro, Shigure, Megami, and Osagamo initially is following. She's able to make better than 12 knots or so, so it's persisting in the attack. But she just has a smashed bow. Japanese destroyers were American ones too. Uh, often when they lost their bow, they stayed in action. Right. You know, they were pretty right. tough ships, actually. Uh, and the same thing happens here. Also, was still underway. She even fires her torpedoes. We now know for sure because the wreck, they were gone, but that she had fired them. But so she continues in the fight to the second phase, right before the gunfire phase. Which, I, which you're about to describe. Uh, so initially you have four ships proceeding independently, but it's hardly a formation now. Well, and that's, that's what I was going to say. Anytime you run into a situation where the commanding officer says proceed independently, that's yeah. your clue that the crap has hit the fan. You yeah. know, things are <laughs> just in disastrous shape right now. And now they're they're about to get worse. The, the appropriate... This, the, is when, this is the same time Nishimura says, Fluso... Uh, yeah, uh, you know, re rejoin as soon as possible. You know, top speed. Yeah. Unaware uh, that the only yeah, thing that so yeah. was yeah. capable of rejoining is the bottom. Right. So her only speed is vertical. Yes, that is <laughs> he's, assume, he's assuming she's limping behind, crippled somewhere. He's figured that out by now. But he figured mm -hmm. she might be able to rejoin and hear him. You know, mean uh, never understood that. You know, completely out of action with him. Like, yeah. yeah. As uh, as as the saying goes, the defecation is about to hit the ventilation, right, boy. and boy, is it. So as McDermott, USS McDermott, cleared the area, one of her torpedo men, a guy named Roy West, looked in the direction of the big ships. Something had caught his eye, a flicker on the horizon, and then another, and then another. West said to no one in particular, quote, wow, would you look at that, unquote. The sight he was looking at were several crimson streaks flashing across the sky in slow, lazy arcs, quote, like meteors, he said later. Several more flashed immediately, and then he could hear a low, throaty rumble like distant thunder. Another torpedo man standing by watching the sight said, quote, that's the big boys. The heavies are shooting, unquote. Indeed, they are. Bill, take us through it. What's going on? Well, <clears throat> Admiral Oldendorf had been monitoring the ambush on the radio via radar reports and, of course, the very late PT boat radio reports. He knew when the destroyers were attacking and could see the flashes from their torpedo hits and the Japanese returned gunfire at, the di at a distance. He wanted his destroyers, those of Desron 56, to clear the area completely before he would open fire with his heavies. But as the Japanese crossed the 20,000-yard range, he felt they were getting too close. So at 0340, the targets were 20,700 yards from Louisville, Oldendor's flagship. The battleships were chomping at the bit to strike. This is kind of getting close, not kind of, almost danger close for a battleship. West Virginia was in the lead of the column, followed by Maryland, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and California. Yes, those names sound familiar, folks. As the Japanese drew to within 15,600 yards from Louisville, Oldendorf gave the order, barking, all right, give the order to open fire. Very creative with that order. <laughs> Oldendorf turned around and grasped the rail on Louisville, awaiting her turrets to shoot, Seth. Yeah. In an instant, the night sky turned into daylight as the cruisers opened fire. And my God, we've talked about these six-inch gun cruisers before. We're about to get into it again. Uh, 0351, Louisville opened fire. Seconds later, Denver, Minneapolis, and Columbia joined in the nighttime song. Portland, too, a minute later, let her eight-inch batteries roar at a target some 15,000 yards distant. That target was the Japanese battleship. Yamashiro. American cruisers, Shropshire had yet to fire, but she was about to get into it here. Absolutely poured fire into the Japanese ships. Over 3,100 rounds were fired by the cruisers on the left flank of the American formation alone. USS Columbia, CL-56, as I put in the notes, would have done the old Helena proud, the original machine gun cruiser. Columbia alone fired an astonishing 1,147 rounds from the 12 barrels of her six-inch main battery. Holy cow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, I, I just incredible. chuckled because this this is just how the Americans have been solving their problems in this war since the beginning. You know, like it's, please, whether it's airplanes yeah, or exactly. guns. Yeah, it's just give me a truckload of shells and I'm going to shoot them at the other guys. So yeah, this yeah. this is what we would expect uh, to have. It's, still, it's incredible. Aboard Maryland, an observer wrote, "Quote: Suddenly, there was a great deal to see." As all cruisers joined from both sides of the channel, the six-inch light cruisers fired so rapidly, each kept four or five salvos in the air, following one another in their beautifully curved trajectories. The eight-inch cruiser fire was more deliberate, but their salvo intervals intervals were amazingly brief, unquote. I mean, this is this shouldn't come as any surprise to, to us because we've talked about these things before, but that is an, an 1,100 rounds of ammunition. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of that's a God. lot of. Boom. You know, I'm just thinking too. Uh, you know, on our whole payback angle, we've got Minneapolis here, which of yes. course absorbed two fish at Tassafaranga, so she's got a little bit of of payback, and, and Portland too, I think, in some capacity. Torpedo hit for November 13th. Battle. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. That, that's right. So. Yeah, there's yeah. there's just a lot of a lot of cold dishes being served here. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. And and this will go back, this what we're about to talk about. Now, this goes back to our, the conversation from last week when we're talking about Mark 8 versus Mark 3 surface radar searches. So the battleships are literally, that you could probably feel them like, oh, come on, damn it. They're getting ready, itching to join in this fight. They were waiting on the order from USS Mississippi. This is Admiral Whaler's flagship. They had yet to receive the word from Mississippi to fire. Why? Because Missy had Mark III surface radar, and she could not range in on Yamashiro. All, all she could pick up were intermittent shell. splashes. Yeah, yeah shell, shell, shell splashes, splashes, exactly. Right. Yeah. She was having an incredibly hard time identifying targets, and she did not relay the order to open fire. Fire. Finally, Rear Admiral Theodore Rudock aboard USS West Virginia, he, he'd had enough. Uh, his radar, the Mark 8 radar, had been tracking large target, obviously Yamashiro, for quite some time and were more than sure what they were tracking were hostile, seeing as how he was watching them via radar get hit. With the range at 22,800 yards, West Virginia opened fire with a full 8-gun, 16-inch, 45-caliber broadside. Kaboom! 30 seconds later, West Virginia's gunnery officer was heard to chuckle and announced to all who could hear that Weavy's first salvo was indeed a hit. Her second salvo was also more than likely a hit. Quote, explosions on their targets, forecastle and foremast structure, unquote. Observers aboard the American battle wagons could see through binoculars that the target was obviously a Japanese battleship. Yamashiro's massive pagoda superstructure stuck out like a sore thumb. But West Virginia is not the only one to open fire, is she, Bill? No, she's not. And by the way, forecastles pronounced folksle in Navy folksle. language. Folksle. The Navy folks folksle. listening or watching would, would be abhorrent. Cringe. You know, yes. cringe if they didn't hear me correct that. So here we go. The American battle line slowly erupted in fire after Weavy, West Virginia, let loose. At 0355, California opened fire with her 14-inch main battery, followed by Tennessee at 0356, one minute later. The 14-inch gun vessels attempted to conserve their AP ammunition by not firing full broadsides, instead letting loose with six gun salvos, and then another, and then another, expending 132 rounds of armor, piercing projectiles between the two of them. So Weavey, on the other hand, had no such inhibitions regarding ammunition expenditure. Nope. In an 18-minute fury, which included a course change to come about, it's called attack or a jibe, depending on whether you're going into the wind or away from the wind, rotate turrets, require the target and open, acquire the target and open fire again. The Pearl Harbor survivor threw 93 rounds of 16-inch AP at Yamashiro, letting loose with a full broadside every 40 seconds. Imagine that, guys. Six every 40 seconds in what would be history's last battleship versus battleship fight. West Virginia was getting her money's worth 
with every blast, Seth. I just oh, wanted to ask Tony, cool. <laughs> I, what, what do the Japanese accounts say about the uh, initial accuracy of the American battleship gunnery? Do, do they corroborate that Weavy creamed her with the first salvo? Yeah, they do. That repeated hits forward and uh, all around the, the armored conning tower. But they also stress, you know, despite the buffeting, like like in a hurricane, the the uh, compass bridge of Yamashita remained intact. And Nishimura remained seemingly unruffled, and her paymaster, who is the senior survivor, standing right behind him. It's like they were just enduring it and just okay. The enemy's dead ahead, and they had a good fix from their radar detectors. And I think your Mastro's radar, it's debated whether or not it was working properly or not, but they had a, they had detect, they had a good bearing on the left flank cruisers anyway, as well as American shore column attacking at that time. So once they were acquired the target, they they resolved to do the same thing, just return fire, heavy battery fire and, and unmass their guns. Not long after making the turn, which I'm sure you'll get into, that's when they suffered the first memorable hit as number three turrets taken out. But yes, they um, corroborate the American battleships. Towers, the first ones are all straddling or direct hits. I mean, uh, Megami, the same thing is near, near. In fact, Megami opens distance because she's getting a lot of the overs from them. Uh, the cr- <laughs> That's a bad feeling. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not doing nothing. <laughs> You're shooting at that guy and I'm taking your shells. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. We we were talking last week, John. You asked which which American battleships had a Mark III, and I said Mississippi and Pennsylvania, and I drew a blank. The other one was USS Maryland. She had the okay. Mark III, and that'll get to the point here. Maryland, Mississippi, and Pennsylvania were all equipped with the older Mark III fire control, and as such, had a difficult time ranging in on the target that their cousins equipped with the Mark VIII were absolutely pummeling. Uh, Maryland, Cali, uh, Tennessee, and Weavey. Correct. Those, those are the Mark 8 ships. Okay. Thanks. Correct. Maryland was desperate to get into the fight and unable to range in on Yamashiro herself, ranged in on the shell splashes, which is what Mark 3s could do at that kind of distance, uh, and finally opened fire and shot 48 rounds of 16-inch AP at the target. Mississippi fired only one salvo, and Pennsylvania didn't fire at all. Um, through all the large caliber shell fire, the cruisers continued their absolute rain of shell fire on the Japanese ships, who by now were returning fire rather uh, rather blindly, albeit. Uh, the left flank cruisers began firing at Yamashiro 0351 Portland, seeing that Yamashiro was blanketed with shell fire, shifted fire to Mogami, while Denver tracked Shiguri, Shiguri and inadvertently hit USS Albert W. Grant instead. As this group, this is the form, last group of American destroyers, were slow in clearing the area. This is exactly what Oldendorf had feared, and it right. actually does come to fruition right here. Denver pounds, or at least we think it's Denver. It probably was Denver. Pounds Albert W. Grant here with shell fire. So on the left flank, USS Phoenix CL-46 let loose with a full 18-gun salvo every 15 seconds, while Boise, now pouring it into Yamashiro, was ordered to make sure to make her fire more deliberate, quote unquote, as she was blowing through ammunition at an astonishing rate. Shropshire finally gets into the fray, beginning her work with slow salvos and then opening up with everything she had after she had changed course and began a westerly run across the strait. You know, there's some there's some photographs of this event and it, you know, I mean, it does look in sporadic places on, on the uh, horizon looks like daylight. But I can you even imagine what that must have looked like at night? I mean, good God, all that shell fire just tearing through the night sky. John, you were, you look like you're about to say something. I'm just no, I'm just uh, as as you just trying to envision what that would be like. Incredible. I the, the ranges are significantly longer than they were uh, at the, the, the battleship fight in Savo Island. I mean, uh, Kirishima and, and Washington were about 8,000 yards apart, 7,800 when they were getting into it. But again, just given the sheer volume of fire going on here and the enormous advantage that we have in our smaller combatants, and all of it's converging, of course, from you know, yeah. from front and both sides, you know, all onto this little pocket of of three or four enemy ships. You know, say good night, Johnny. That's just yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's it's incredible. Remarking on that shell fire, Captain Smoot aboard their retreating American destroyers said, "Quote: 
the devastating accuracy of this gunfire was the most beautiful sight I had ever witnessed, unquote. The arch, any quotes again, the arch line of tracers in the darkness looked like a continual stream of railroad cars going over a hill. No target could be observed at first, then shortly there would be fires and explosions and another ship would be accounted for, unquote. Just an absolute beat down of epic proportions john you wanted or uh, i'm sorry tony you wanted to say something about shropshire as uh yamasho gets a good fix on shropshire and she she has the unwelcome distinction being one of the ones that yamasho is straddling uh and uh, uh along with the uh, Denver, i believe is the other uh because the cruisers because of the same thing you call the machine gun fire also gave mm -hmm. the japanese plenty of time to lock in on them it was nearly as good as a radar fix or a visual fix because it's so continuous. So they exactly. used it. So that's why our exactly. attention tends to go to them. Uh, exactly. And the Australians take some pride in that kind of in a backward, you know, in a, in a, in a ironic sense that they're just, you know, Shropshire had her big moment because it's, she's the one that gets some direct attention. And it's, a, uh, so uh, it's just interesting in that sense. And, the, and the Runta's torpedo attack earlier may have been, may have scored too, as we mentioned. So the Australian role in the battle is notable. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, can you guys enlighten us on some of this damage that Yamashiro's taking right now from shell fire? We'd already talked about some of the torpedo damage. Lay it on us with the with this. I mean, this. I mean, she is she's getting beat to live in hell. Can you can you describe what the heck's going on in here? Uh, John, describe what happened in detail that we kind of know about Kirishima to give an idea of what happens when shells hit. And that'll give you a bit of a picture. But during this time, Yamashiro is taking heavy caliber shell hit after heavy caliber shell hit, knocks out number three turret. She swings to port to unmask her own battery. So she's firing full broadsides too, minus number three turret for a while. Uh, while taking all these hits, very Karishima like you can imagine. One of the tragedies of when they found the wreck, uh, the unfortunate things is since it's upside down at the bottom, all the any idea of all the shell hits will still remain forever unknown. You know, uh, it, it did reveal answers about where torpedoes hit, which had its own value. But shell hits are obscured because they're buried in the mud. So we will never know how what kind of pasting Yamasha was taking as far as where they hit and what they hit. But if you look at Kirishima, it's very important. It's also an old ship, uh, kind of like the uh, Yamasha in that regard, too. So it's very instructive. But we know that there were multiple hits and fires breaking out there where damage control had to mean directly to this fire, to this fire, to this fire. But we also know that the main battery turrets remained in action. The last one to be knocked out, number one remains in action until she sinks. Mm -hmm. So number three is knocked out early. The two aft turrets would have were unmasked, so they would have expended their ammunition quick uh, because that's their opportunity. They don't have, a, you know, they have, they have flooded magazines from aft to the Right. Um, the damage control measure. But during this time, the Yamashiro secondary battery is vigorously engaging both the destroyers and the cruisers. So that's what's going on under this. So this is where, John, plug in what happened to Karishma. Just give a little of that visual, even if you revisit sure. it. Sure. I mean, it, basically, you know, the, so, the ex post facto um, analysis of, of the shoot against Karishma, you know, again, when I was growing up, I was always taught that she was hit between six and nine times. And it right. turns out that she probably got hit two dozen times. And a lot of those hits were underwater because what would happen was a shell would hit slightly in front of it and would just dive into her, uh, into and through her armored uh, belt and right into her engineering spaces or what have you. Uh, to me, again, the fact that Yamashiro is hit by this volume of shells and manages to sink uh, relatively quietly, as opposed to being blown into, you know, smithereens by a magazine hit is another sort of minor miracle. But it, there is just no way that a ship of this vintage is going to be able to absorb that quantity of, of heavy caliber gunfire and, and remain upright for any more than just a few minutes. And that's exactly what happens. I, I, guys I would that, argue. Oh, that, go ahead, Bill. If that waterline hit you're talking about is an H.E., round it's going to react very differently than if it's an uh armor piercing round right because right. the armor piercing will will penetrate the water yeah. and it's, impact the ship the yeah, AT exactly. makes it explode on the water right 
Yeah, and these are all obviously our ships are all firing AP at this point. So, okay. yeah, the, the other the other problem with with those those short hits as well is that they're all going to hit on her. Uh, she's she's turned to port to unmask her batteries, so she's getting she's getting clobbered on her starboard side, which is going to lead then to asymmetric flooding. It's all going to be on her starboard side, and if you're a damage control person, that is not what you want to be seeing. And 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 reg regarding the hits that that Yamashiro is absorbing right now, you know, you said a battleship of her vintage would never survive it. I I would argue that any ship would be hard pressed to survive this yeah. kind of beating. I mean, this no. is yeah, yeah, this is Five, epic. Six you six have to look at your models. Yeah, that'd be the only exception, maybe. Right. Yeah, six battleships to one. I mean, yeah. Again, say good night, Johnny. It's it's yeah. it's it's over. Even yeah. before yes. anyway. And Nishimura so concludes that too, uh, because during the, as it right before she unmasked her battery and stuff, he sends a final telegram. He says, "Tell all commands, Giyokusai, we proceed till totally annihilated." Right. You know, yeah, I'm not coming back, and I'm doing my mission to divert the forces. Right. And the Japanese term is for it is Giyokusai, and that's the uh, that's the word they also use for those suicidal bond by charges that ended Saipan. Right. And Iwo Jima, yeah. when the last mm -hmm. forces were thrown out. And right. that's yeah. the message he said. And it starts to be that's, said. that's the formal Japanese way of saying uh, our goose is cooked. And yeah, yeah this is the yeah. end. Yeah. Farewell. Perfect way to put it. Bill, what's going on aboard Mogami right now? Well, the, the American fire looked like lights turning on one after another in a dark room. As she nears the battle line, Towers of water begun to erupt around her. Desiring to unleash her long lances, Mogami turned to unmask her tubes, and as she did so, she came almost head-on at USS Daily, DD-519. 519. The two ships raced past one another, firing at each other at a range of about 5,000 yards, two and a half miles, folks. The American destroyers poured fire into the Midway veteran, and fires began to sprout aboard the cruiser. As Megami turned and tried to get away, the cruisers opened fire on her. Six and eight inch shell fire rained down on the cruiser as she tried in vain to unmask her tubes, which she eventually did do, and eventually get away from the firestorm of shells. But by 353, 0353, Megami was on fire and still taking hits at 0402. A shell probably fired from Portland exploded on the bridge, killing all officers, including the captain. Other hits to the engine room slowed her to a crawl. Of course, speed is life in these kinds of battles, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a real soft spot in my heart for Mogami. Um, you know, having written a book on Midway, as, as we did, right? Um Mogami is an example of good damage control on the part of the Japanese. And, you know, the fact she was badly beaten up in, in at Midway as well. And for the people on our, our channel who don't know it, they they tore off her aft turrets because they had been demolished uh, by fires. And they basically they rebuilt her as an aircraft cruiser. And so her whole aft end is a is a flight deck for float planes and that sort of thing. She's not really the kind of asset that you would want in a fight like this. And yet here she is uh, at the end of her career and just, yeah, just getting gunned down. Yeah. Hey, Tony, can you can you get into some detail about the the beating that Mogami's taking right here? Can you tell us about what's going on aboard ship? Uh, as she tries to position the launcher torpedoes, she makes a circular maneuver to uh, pull away. First of all, she pulled away from Yamashiro because that's where all those overs are going. <laughs> and then she maneuvers to do a turn yeah. to fire torpedoes around while also doing a retirement motion. Uh, it, it's a standard doctrinal attack that they do. Uh, but during this time, she's taking hit after hit after hit that explodes some of her own torpedoes in their tubes before she can launch them. Others she's able to launch. Uh, the the hit on the bridge was mentioned. There's the 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 flight deck aft is getting set afire and smashed. Forward turrets taking blows, and here's here's a here's a new fact since since my book was published. I didn't know this at the time, but from new research from uh, 
American records available now that were found on Maryland. Robert Lundgren thinks that Maryland was also rounded on Montgomery. And this would make a lot of sense because that means those two shells that went through her bridge and killed everybody but didn't detonate, they're, they're armor piercing from Maryland probably. Oh, that's a notion, isn't it? Yeah. That would make sense, yeah. Yeah. And Maryland yeah. was having difficulty rounding in, according to Robert Lundgren. It's actually Megami's that centers on because she followed the splashes, and those are around Megami. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Makes perfect yeah. Sense. yeah. Yeah. Bat a battleship yeah. shell into your bridge. That'll make a mess of things, right? Killed the yeah, captain, just... almost all the senior officers of it uh, in one blow, but they didn't detonate. So it's not like you have the bridge blown to bits. And that sounds like battleship shells. USS uh, San Francisco at Guadalcanal Barroom Brawl. Just ask her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same kind thing. of thing. Same thing. So after receiving word that his destroyers uh, were receiving friendly fire at this time, Oldendorf, Oldendorf ordered ceasefire at 0409 aboard USS Albert W. Grant that we mentioned earlier. The target of the friendly fire, a shell hit Grant's fantail, knocking out the five, knocking out the number five five-inch turret. Uh, more shells from both sides. So she's actually receiving fire from both sides. Punched into the forward stack and the forward boiler room forward engine room, gun mounts, and various interior compartments. The destroyer would be towed out of the area later, her casualties mounting to 38 men killed in action and a further 104 wounded. Not all of the hits were friendly, as we were just saying, although more than half were six-inch shell hits from Amer American cruisers, more than likely USS Denver. Um, mm -hmm. I have in the notes here, discretion is the better part of valor. And Admiral Shima was probably more than likely aware of this saying, what is Shima doing right now as this is just, the, the fight has turned into an absolute annihilation. Yeah, what is Shima doing? It's, it's, it's time to, it's time to get out of Dodge pretty clearly. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's what he's doing, Tony. Uh, when the ceasefire happens, Nishimura, uh, his flagship, the Mashro, is still underway, still, still, if not in fighting shape, is still going on. So they turn, they turn to starboard and start to retire. So does Megami and so does Shiguri. So they all start to retire because they're aware they, Shima has entered the radio telephone net by now, and they know Nachi is just about to arrive. So they're going to meet her. Yamashiro, after having successfully made this turn, and his mate of 180 is now headed down the strait, gets more torpedo hits from American destroyers, and capsizes the port and sinks abruptly. Mm -hmm. This is after the ceasefire that Odendorf had ordered. And Tennessee observes her on the radar shrink and vanish. In other words, the, clearly marking where she sank, gets the time right, everything matches the Japanese accounts very well. Mm -hmm. At the time that happened, Nachi is inside of her coming north. The sub for 190420. I'll get to Shima as we go on later. But at this moment, when Namashiro sinks, Megami is staggering, all in fire, bridge knocked out, not even really under control, staggering south. Shiguri, an interesting thing when you're talking about the railroad cars and all this, Shiguri's experience is instructive too. Because the destroyer at first tries to make an attack, because the doctrine calls for you do you do not open gunfire until you can fire your torpedoes. Right. Shiguri is trying to charge the left flank cruisers to launch a torpedo attack, but it's been so surrounded by shell splashes, gyro compass is knocked out. The ship is shaking so much, she can't even retire, turn to fire torpedoes. Any turn, with, there's so many water around, can't even maneuver. That's how much they described how bad the avalanche of shells around wow. was. So she turned, she finally succeeds in turning around. Uh, gets a shell hit in the starboard quarter in the fantail, an eight-inch shell, puts a hole in Shiguri's stern, and damages her rudder where it becomes flaky after that. So this is what is happening after Oldendorf has ordered the ceasefire. Yamashiro has tried to retire, but capsizes and sinks. Shiguri is wobbling without rudder control. Megami is in worse shape without rudder control. They're trying to move south. Asagamo had already turned around Having fired all our torpedoes, the better part of the battle was to retreat and down to nine right. miles. So it's limping down toward the Fuso wreck by this time. And the Fuso wreck means the fire. That huge oil fire is still burning. But the Fuso's gone. It's sunk under by this time. 
Right. But it would confuse a lot of people because you have the drifting wreck of the Os Osaguma there. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> absolute, absolute execution. And that execution is over pretty much, not really, but close by sunrise. Uh, Oldendorf briefly considered pursuit, but possible Japanese, tor possible more you know, definite Japanese torpedoes, uh, and more importantly, lack of ammunition caused Oldendorf to change his mind. Uh, he issued orders to his destroyers and some of the cruisers to nose their way into the wreckage to search for survivors and lay eyes on the destruction. Uh, on the subject of survivors, Oldendorf said, quote, do not overload your ships with survivors. Search each man well to see that he does not have any weapons. Anyone offering resistance, shoot him. Proceed independently to pick up survivors, unquote. Japanese destroyer Asa Asaguma, as you were saying, Tony, hit by torpedoes, was spotted by cruisers USS Denver and Columbia, who finished her off with shell fire. Um, this, and we're not done, but, but we kind of need to put a bow on this thing here. Bill, this had been a beating of biblical proportions. I mean, one of the few naval battles in history where it was just, it wasn't one-sided, but it was damn near one-sided. Tell us, wrap it up for us here. Well, for the Americans, casualties were extremely light, with the majority of them coming from the friendly fire against Albert W. Grant and her ordeal. Again, the casualty figures between the two battleships, we know that the crews were between 1,600 and 1,900 apiece, so that's, you know, 3,200 to 3,800 men and only about 20 of them live so just between the two battleships alone you've you're you on the upper end could be pushing nearly 4,000 4, guys and then uh mogami how many how many get lost aboard her tony uh if i remember correctly it's close to 200 it's not what you'd expect from her pounding she takes maybe saying forget the figure offhand uh the destroyers though suffer horribly mrs heel has only four survivors and yamaguno only has two Right. Uh, oh, Osaguma is 40. Okay. So, yeah, I, yeah, I, I would say that it, it's, it's definitely in the neighborhood of 4,000 has to be. Easily. Yeah. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Well, Oldendorf had done his job and done it perfectly. When looking at his and his ship's performance, save the obvious friendly fire incident on Grant, there is little to nothing to pick apart. The after action report on this one would have been easy. His placement of the ships, his plans, his execution of plans, and his calmness under fire were exactly as one would expect from an officer who had seen as much action as he had at this point. Sir Gal Straits was truly his finest hour, Seth. Yeah, uh, he reflected years later on the battle. He said, quote, my theory as an old time gambler, never give a sucker a chance, unquote. <laughs> right. <laughs> if I may. Go ahead. Uh, just to tie up one thing so as not to uh, leave it un unaddressed, Shima's force right behind was an hour behind Nishimura's force going north. They arrived just as Yamashiro was sinking. He he tries a fire, fire torpedo attack, launches a string of torpedoes at battle line. But because the southbound Megami is out of control at that time, they make a miscalculation and Nazi slams into Megami. So yeah, they have a collision with Megami. The flagship, Shima's flagship, is damaged, running into Megami, mostly by Nazi's error. Because of this damage and because of the hopelessness of battle and the burning wrecks, it's very clear to him the situation is hopeless. His staff persuades Shima to retreat, and that they retreat down the strait, along with Shiguri and Megami, and they all get out of the strait in the daylight. Asaguma is sunk at sunrise. But it should be mentioned that the follow-up is that Shima's force escapes, except for the light cruiser Bukuma being sunk by air attack. And the and the Megami, the famous Megami, is finally finished off by air attack as they're leaving, but was part of Shima's force by then. So I just wanted to cover the role of Shima's force so that it not be overlooked so people wouldn't be confused by that, yeah. by the non-mention of it, because but it's swiftly covered in that sense. Shiguri seems to have just run away, never even rejoined Shiguri. Uh, Shima, but that's another. Story. Can't really blame her. Yeah, some some days it's good to just kind of run away. <laughs> yes, yeah. in in the words of Monty Python, right? <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. Brave yeah, Sir Robin. Away. Yes. Yeah. 
So as Oldendorf is having his ships clear the area, he began to receive frantic messages at 0, 0, 0707 of another action occurring in San Bernardino Strait. Apparently, Japanese battleships had somehow slipped through San Bernardino Strait and were now taking the escort carriers of Rear Admiral Ziggy Sprague's Task Force 77.4.3, better known by their call sign, Taffy 3, under fire. Low on ammunition in some ships, Oldendorf relayed a message to Kincaid and Halsey saying, quote, about 0700 CTU 77.4.3 reported under fire from enemy battleships and cruisers, evidently came through San Bernardino during the night, request immediate airstrike, also request support from heavy ships, my OBBs, low, on, low in ammunition, unquote. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. And of course, where are the carriers? <laughs> the world wonders. <laughs> yeah. Dude, the world wonders. Indeed. Exactly. Indeed. So at 0847, Oldendorf receives a reply from Kincaid, quote, please proceed with entire force to a point 25 miles west of point FIN. Be prepared to join escort carriers informing me ETA, unquote. Expected to turn around and save Taffy 3. Oldendorf was in a very tough spot, as I put in the notes, but he would comply as best he could. Now, Tony, you had mentioned that as far as the ammunition was concerned, and this is very true, that some battleships, specifically Mississippi and Pennsylvania, they still had, they didn't have a full load, but they still had plenty of ammunition because Pensy didn't even fire once, and Missy only fired one time that we know of. Uh, Maryland, she shot a bit, but she... You know, the ones that were low on ammunition specifically were West Virginia, California, and Tennessee. They had about damn near unloaded their lockers. They were they were riding high. Um, you know, and it's interesting to think. I mean, again, we, we made mention of the top speed of these ships last week, the battleships specifically, the American battleships here. You know, 20 knots downhill, 21 knots maybe with a and wind. Maybe not even that, um, unless yeah. they're willing to potentially do structural damage to her in the process of getting her up there. And that, and that is exactly what I was going to bring up is that Tony had said that that Weavy had had suffered some underwater structural damage when she hit something and she couldn't even make twenty knots. So it's it, it would be damn near impossible for for Oli to get there in time to deal with what obviously is Center Force and Carita. What is y'all's opinion on this? Yeah, just from a, a time motion standpoint, no, she's uh, Oldendorf's not in a good position to intercede on uh, on anybody's behalf at this point. And you have to think too, um, that is not the kind of fight that I want to be in either. Taking my twenty knot battle wagons up to go against a Japanese force that has at least a four knot advantage uh, on me and heavier gun power to boot, uh, you know. Yamato has got a very good fire control suite. Pennsylvania sure as hell doesn't. You know, if you're on that Pennsylvania, yeah. yeah, do, do you want to be fighting Yamato in Pennsylvania? I sure don't. <laughs> but, you know, that, that point better, will be rendered moot. Better than Taffy 3, though, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, again, cry me a river, right? We got to go do what we're going to go do. But, uh, yeah. Nagato probably outclassed all it takes, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I, you would like and, you know, we don't do counterfactuals, or at least we don't do them no. very often. And you would like to think that Oldendorf would have given a damn good account of himself. And he, and he more than likely would have. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I don't it wouldn't have been as one sided as Surigao was. That's for damn sure. Probably not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, as I put in the note, you the mean, Fox was oh, go yeah. ahead, Bill. Seth, you mean there's more to this story? No. No, it's over. We're done. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. MacArthur lands on the Philippines and the war ends. War ends. It. It. It's, it's all over. Just mm -hmm. like right mm -hmm. after D-Day, you know, there was no, there was nothing after Normandy. You know, the war was nothing over. Yeah, well, it was boring. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So as I put in the notes, the fox was among the chickens, as the saying goes. Uh, somebody, we all know who, had screwed up. That was for certain who and why did not matter at this point. Somebody had to save Taffy 3. Uh, their small force was no match for what was now identified as Kirita's center force. Or were they? 
and we will find that out soon enough in what is going to be called by history, the Battle of Samar next week. Guys, is there anything else you want to add to this beatdown of Nishimura at Surigao Strait by Oldendorf? Anything at all? You know, Tony, you had in the notes, you know, looking at some of the wreck footage, but the, but there there's so much that we can learn from this wreck footage. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, just very briefly, as, uh, as it ties into battle, after uh, Oldendorf got this word from Kincaid, that's probably why Shima's force survives to escape. I mean, they have a, mm -hmm. if a few air escort carrier plane attacks, but those are called back as, a, as the next action starts. So that's Fish probably why Shima even escapes and Shiguri gets away and all that. So for them, it was good news what happened. Uh, so Shima's force gets away uh, mostly back to Manila or, and Shiguri back to Brunei. As far as the wrecks, what, what they revealed it very briefly is that, as said before, the Fuso sank in one piece is a kind of a switchblade on the bottom. The Yamasho also is up to, oh, the Fuso is upside down. It's a switchblade. Understand that. It's an upside down wreck fit. Yamasho is upside down on the bottom. It told us where some of the torpedo hits hit, but all the gunfire damage is hidden. And most interesting, it solved the mystery of Mr. Shield. That destroyer sunk by McDermott is the Grand Slam did happen. McDermott definitely hit Mississippi. Some accounts imply Hutchins finished her off further north. No, Mississippi went down at the same latitude as y y Yamagumo, just as some of the earlier reconstruction suggested. She just found her from her one torpedo hit in the engine room and is on the same latitude as Yamagumo wreck. So mm -hmm. the, that's what this, the expeditions revealed. Of the, uh, the National Museum of the Philippines, you should go look at their website and Facebook page and Robert Kraft's. Uh, Petrel mm -hmm. RV Facebook page, while that covered the covered the wreck explorations in 2017, they're still accessible. Yeah. Cool. We we've mentioned Petrel uh, multiple times because all 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 of us all four all of us, us. Had, had had done yeah. work with Petrel uh, in, in one way, shape, or form over the years, and their um, their expeditions and the footage that they have, you know that they recorded that is now available that the pictures that we've seen have just further added to the story and our understanding of these naval fights and it's absolutely invaluable it's ridiculously important ridiculously important yeah. well gentlemen i want to thank personally both of you personally tony thank you very much for being here man i really really appreciate yeah. you being here it was great fun it was great fun yeah I mean, you're so, two weeks in a row, too. I know. <laughs> Man, I tell you, it's amazing how fast a week flies. It really does. Yeah. Stuff lunch it's down your crazy. face in five minutes. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's Not just like, boom. Change your yeah. clothes. Yeah. Unreal. Unbelievable. My God. My goodness. Yep. So anyway, with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. If you want to look at our YouTube channel and watch this very conversation, please do so. If you want to send us a comment or a question, send it to our email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Perrin. I want to thank you very much for listening and or watching. John, my friend, thank you for being here with us. It's Thanks always so great fun. Yeah. yeah, it was a good time. Thank you. Tony, again, Thanks. thank you very much. You're very welcome. Bill, bring us home. I'm Bill Toady. See you again next week.